project even is. Uh, so the thesis is a capstone part of our curriculum. It's a 6,000 word uh, journalistic monster that requires deep reporting, uh, narrative development, and analysis on some scientific topic. You're going to see a really wide range of scientific topics uh, here today. And students actually start working on these projects before they've even been admitted to MIT. Uh, students are required to, applicants are required to propose a couple of potential topics uh, in their application to MIT. And that's really so that once they get here, we can hit the ground running with them. We can start these projects almost immediately from the first day they walk in. And the reason we do that is because these projects are really hard. <laughs> um, I'm also a graduate of the program. I have written a thesis. I'm still emotionally recovering. Uh, it is a lot of work um, in addition to having sharp writing and reporting skills. It's really very much a mental test um, that requires time and patience and doggedness and an unfortunate degree of humility a lot of times to really get these projects going. Uh, so that's a really, really long way of saying we are tremendously proud of our students um, who, who are here today. So presentations are gonna run about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll have a really short Q&A afterwards. Uh, but before passing this along, I want to say just a couple thank yous. First of all, to the thesis advisors who have so generously given their time and expertise to getting these projects where they are. Uh, secondly, to Michael Gravito and to Shannon Larkin, uh, who are here. And Shannon, as everybody knows, is very much the heart and soul of our program, who makes everything run. Uh, thank you. And also to the Kelly Douglas Fund. A lot of these projects required travel. Kelly Douglas Fund is a key part of why we're able to send our students off to far-flung regions of the world um, in order to be able to do this. Uh, but lastly, I also want to thank everybody who's in this room, everyone who's, who's looking over live stream, having a network uh, and support system filled with people who are cheering you on and helping you when this program gets really hard is a crucial part of our program. It's a crucial part of why we are all able to do what we do. Uh, so thank you so much for supporting our students um, in every often unrecognized way that you do. Um, and so with that, all of that said, uh, I'm going to pass this off to Allison Guy. She's going to kick us off with Ecosystem Reboot. Put on my timer so I don't go too long. All right, so, oh, uh, Shannon, how do I see it with the, with the notes on it? Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. All right. All good. <laughs> okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Allison, and today I'm going to be talking about an effort to rescue some of the very last living corals left in Florida and sort of what this means for the future of coral reefs around the world. Uh, so how did I get interested in coral conservation? Uh, as everyone already seen this slide, uh, I lived in the Philippines for two years when I was like a teeny tiny little preteen, and I learned to scuba dive with my Girl Scout troop. And obviously, coral reefs are super cool, so I've been into them since then. But let's move from the Philippines in the late 90s, yes, I'm that old, to Miami in 2014. So um, you might not know it, but Miami actually has a coral reef, or once had a coral reef. Uh, and back in 2014, things were particularly bad in Miami, especially around this little island called Virginia Key, which is in the harbor of Miami. Um, so there was a massive dredging project at the time, which was stirring up sediment. There was a pipe that was leaking raw sewage. There still is a pipe leaking raw sewage. Um, there is obviously the runoff from a gigantic metro area that was lacing the water with fertilizers, motor oil, other pollutants. Uh, and to cap it all off, there was 
extreme heat. So um, flor uh, corals across Florida um, bleach, they turned white, uh, which is uh, sort of like a, when a coral catches a fever. Um, and they, do, they did recover from this heat wave, but they were very ill afterwards. And so living in hot poop soup, uh, the corals did what you would expect them to do. They got sick. Um, and they got sick with this new disease called stony coral tissue loss. And so here is a um, healthy pillar coral, healthy pillar coral. Uh, this is with stony coral tissue loss disease. And this is a, a few months later, dead. Um, and so I'm gonna read a little, oh, nope, no, I'm not. Okay, <laughs> I, I like rearranged the order of the slides last night, so I forgot. Um, <laughs> So I want to back up a little bit and explain that even before 2014, disease was nothing new to Caribbean reefs. Um, so for the last several hundred thousand years, these three species have been like the main ecosystem engineers of Caribbean reefs. So elkhorn coral and staghorn coral are the main reef builders and longspine sea urchins are the main grazers. And grazers are really important in coral reefs because they mow down the algae that would otherwise overgrow corals because algae grows fast, corals grow slow. You need something to beat back that seaweed. Uh, but beginning in around the, roughly around the middle of last century, the human population <coughs> exploded in the region. Um, so, you know, farms, coastal development, leaking uh, sewage into the water, fertilizer, all sorts of nasty stuff. Uh, and at the same time, we were pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So the ocean, especially in the Caribbean, was getting much, much, much warmer. Uh, and by the late 1970s, things really went sideways. And uh, what was it 1990s, 1977, 78, something like that? Uh, corals around the US Virgin Islands started dying. So elkhorn and staghorn started dying. And within a few years, uh, nearly every single one of these corals throughout the Caribbean had died off. So only five out of every hundred survived. And as soon as that died out in the mid eighties, uh, a different disease came for long spine sea urchins and killed off nearly all of them. So reefs were left totally empty of their main corals and of their main grazer. Uh, and just to sort of show you how bad things were. So this is a reef off of Key Largo in 1975. And you can see it's got tons and tons of healthy living coral. This is that same reef in 2014. And so this is actually before stony coral tissue loss disease reached this reef. Uh, and so there would actually, sadly, nowadays be even more dead coral here. Oh, and now I'm going to read a section of my thesis. OK. Uh, so backing up a little bit, just talking about the stony coral tissue loss. OK, so here's the reading. Um, the disease killed ruthlessly with white necrotic lesions that gave the ailment its name, stony coral tissue loss. The pillar corals counted some of the worst casualties, 93% of infected colonies died. The pathogen dispatched boulder, brain, star, and maize corals too, roughly half of the Caribbean's 40-odd reef-building species. Despite some early warnings, the state's conservation community largely assumed the disease would blow up and then die back down, says Aaron Muller, who manages the Coral Health and Disease Program at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. Disease is nothing new to Florida's reefs, and for the most part, outbreaks are short-lived. I don't think as a community we realized this was going to be different, Muller says, and obviously it was. The pathogen quietly traveled north and south, hitching rides on currents and in ships' ballast water. In 2017, it reached the northernmost of the Florida Keys, the chain of islands that curves off the state's southern tip. Once we realized it was moving down into the Keys, that's when the red flag started going, Muller says. By the time Muller and other reef experts met in 2018 to iron out a plan for the disease, it was clear that Florida was facing down an extinction level event. There was little the scientists could do to stop the spread of stony coral tissue loss, short of turning off ocean currents and shutting down ship traffic. Instead, a coalition of state and federal agencies with help from universities, nonprofits, and public aquariums decided to attempt a last minute mission to get corals out of the ocean and into tanks on land. But time was running out. If the rescue squad didn't get to the corals before the disease did, there would be little left to save. Uh, and I just want to say, as an aside, uh, the disease has shown no signs of slowing down. So you can sort of see from this graph that by now it has reached um, pretty much every, every far-flung corner of the Caribbean. Uh, so it really is the worst known coral disease uh, to science. 
So um, the scientists at that 2018 meeting hatched a plan to literally rescue Florida's corals from the ocean um, and keep them safe in tanks on land. Um, and I really want to emphasize just how unprecedented this plan was. No one has ever attempted before to rescue not just like one or two species, but the basis of an entire ecosystem. And nothing on this time scale has ever been attempted. So carbon persists in the atmosphere for about a thousand years. Um, which means that like we might be looking not at like decades of concert of keeping these corals alive, but you know, potentially centuries. Uh, and on the advice of wildlife geneticists, they decided to collect 200 individuals of 15 priority species, meaning they would need 3,000 corals overall. So from 2018 to 2020, the rescue team embarked on several collection cruises. Uh, they visited 200 dive sites in total. And the last collection cruise was in March 2020, which ended literally days before the entire country shut down for COVID. So to a sort of, you know, coral pandemic, human pandemic running up against each other. Um, in the end, they wound up with uh, around 2,400 corals. Sadly, some species were already really rare by that time. For example, they only found 20 rough cactus corals uh, and only, I think, 20, 20 pillar corals. Oh, there you go, rough cactus coral. So now that they had, you know, well over 2,000 corals, the big question was, where do you put all of them? Uh, you know, corals, cost, it costs a lot of money to maintain them. You need specialized expertise. You need a lot of space, too. Um, and it quickly become clear that government-owned facilities weren't going to be able to house all of these corals. So they put out a call to the Association of Zoos and Alumni, and incredibly, um, around 25 different institutions across the country responded. They did things like they found tank, like empty tanks. They made room in uh, broom closets for the corals. So these were really sort of like an evacuation situation. This, this, uh, you know, incredible last-minute response to take on these corals. And this, this right here is the biggest of these uh, these institutions. It's called the Florida Coral Rescue Center. Uh, it is off a like unassuming little strip mall in um, Orlando, and it's a really cool place. It kind of looks like a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> so the next challenge was, all right, we have all these corals. We have, you know, more or less 200 of each species, but how do we grow their populations? You can't have a healthy captive population if you're not, you know, actively trying to increase their numbers while increasing their genetic diversity, because again, Problem with if you have low genetic diversity, you're inbred, you're susceptible to disease, and so on. Whereas if you're very diverse, you know there might be some corals there that could resist stony coral tissue loss, resist the effects of climate change. And so this is where this awesome person, Carrie O'Neill, comes in. Uh, so she's the coral biologist at the Florida Aquarium, and she found herself uh, sort of the uh, the coral mom to a bunch of these super super rare pillar corals. So there are more pillar corals alive in her tanks than there are in the wild in all of Florida. And she wanted to, to get her corals to spawn, to breed them. But the problem is no one had ever gotten Caribbean corals to breed in captivity before. So this is where uh, Jamie Craggs comes in. He's the head aquarist at the Horniman Museum in London. And uh, around uh, 2011, he cracked the code of getting corals to spawn in captivity. And it really just comes down to like a very fancy system of lights to mimic moon, stars, sunset, so on. And he traveled to the Florida Aquarium to design a spawning system for the pillar corals. And lo and behold, it worked. So the very first Caribbean coral to spawn in captivity. And I just want to show you the super cool video of what spawning actually looks like. It works. Can't tell. Oh, I think it's, I, I see little things are moving. Sorry, there's like, there's a bright flash from someone's camera. Okay, come on. There you go. <laughs> it looks like they're sneezing. And those are little, those are, those are eggs uh, and sperm, little, little eggsies, eggsies and spermsies. Uh, and since then, the Florida Aquarium has spawned a whole bunch of different species uh, along with other institutions. And if you want to see what a coral larvae looks like, so when I visited Carrie in February, her rough cactus corals had just spawned, and the little coral larvae, uh, so that's the coral babies or embryos, they look like teeny tiny little sesame seeds, like little swimming sesame seeds. They're very cute. <laughs> How do I go forward? 
So, you know, thousands of coral larvae will turn into thousands of young corals. And this is the, you know, next, oops, there you go, the third final and hardest phase of the Florida Coral Rescue, which is actually trying to bring the reef back from the dead. So right now the reef only has 2% live coral cover, historical average was 60%. And they're trying this really unprecedented effort to restore an entire marine ecosystem. Uh, and so the first start, uh, phase of this really is you take the corals from captivity and you put them in these ocean nurseries on these floating PVC Christmas trees. And these are good for the coral because they get lots of current, they get lots of sunlight, uh, and they grow much faster in this way. And when they are big enough, you literally just snap pieces off of them and cement them to the reef using a marine epoxy. Oh, yeah. Uh, so if you guys remember, Carrie's Fort Reef looks like garbage. <laughs> uh, so they are actively trying to restore this reef because it's a very famous reef. Uh, and you can see that, uh, so these are, uh, these are Elkhorn coral. You can see that the restoration actually works pretty well. Uh, only three or four out of every 10 of these outplanted baby corals were, will survive their first years of life. But the ones that do survive seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, and overall, so this is part of a larger government-run project called Mission Iconic Reefs, uh, and they are trying to bring back seven reefs along the Florida Keys, uh, and it's going to be a total of 70 acres overall, but it's going to cost $100 million, and they're going to at least need uh, uh, 500,000 baby corals. So, you know, that really gives you an idea of the high costs involved with restoring even like a teeny tiny portion of a dead ecosystem, and unfortunately, we still don't know if it's going to work, but it's worth trying. Unfortunately, so here's like the real bummer stuff. So new research came out last year that looked at all of the threats that coral reefs are facing. So not just from high heat, but from acidification, overfishing, um, you know, fertilizer pollution, plastic pollution, more powerful storms. And this research uh, said that coral reefs will be functionally extinct by 2035. So that doesn't mean that corals will be extinct. It just means that reefs as an ecosystem will no longer be able to provide their wonderful services like, you know, fish habitat, storm protection, and so on. So it's becoming increasingly clear that coral reefs are going to disappear if we don't do anything. Um, in all likelihood, we're going to need a Florida coral rescue for every coral species on Earth. But the numbers are like really staggering. The Caribbean only has 40 species of coral. Uh, the Philippines, where I lived when I was little, has 600 species. And overall, uh, the total suspected number of species is 1,000. Uh, so people are actually trying to make uh, sort of a Noah's Ark for corals. This is a project in Australia. They want to house every single species of coral on Earth. Problem is it's a ton of money. Just building the center they want to build will cost $70 million. And right now they only have 150 colonies when they're going to need thousands and thousands and thousands. It takes a lot of money, space, time, and expertise. So this is where Mary Hagedorn comes in. What takes far less time, money, and expertise is cryopreservation. Uh, and cryopreservation is just rapidly freezing living tissue down to like uh, some insane number, like negative 200 degrees Celsius or something. Uh, and then when you want to revive it, you just rapidly warm it using lasers. It's really cool. Um, and so for the last 14 years, Mary Hagedorn has been perfecting the art of cryopreserving coral sperm coral sperm, eggs, larvae, and adult tissue. So what's really cool about this is you can freeze a larvae, you can keep it frozen for theoretically as long as a thousand years, and then you can revive it and will come back to life and you know, happily turn into an adult coral again. Thanks to her, we know more about cryopreserving corals than we do any other kind of wild animal. Corals are animals. Uh, and she recently launched a project called the Coral Biobank Alliance, which aims to cryopreserve every species of reef building coral by 2026. Um, they do have a long way to go. So far, they've only cryopreserved 50 different species, and they are aiming for 1,000. And I will leave you on this sad slide. Unless we drastically and immediately slash greenhouse gas emissions, this is what's going to be left of the world's coral reefs, tanks and freezers. And I want to thank my dear thesis advisor. Thank you for reading so much garbage <laughs> patiently. I also want to thank my first thesis advisor, Seth, for helping me so much with my outline and early thoughts. Uh, thank you 
thanks so much to all of the, the wonderful staff and other professors in the program and to my few remaining tethers to sanity, my beautiful classmates and Primrose the Cockatiel. <laughs> up for questions. We've got time for about five minutes of questions for each, and then I believe B. Jacobs is, is next. Oh, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that there's like many more species in like the Philippines, let's say. If we're trying to like cut costs, could you only preserve, let's say like not all, but some of the coral species and still like be able to rehabilitate reefs or do you need all of the species for that like ecosystem to work? That's a great question. So they are aiming for all of the species, but I am sure, so no one brought this up, but I'm sure that they are titrating which species are the most important. And I know that the people who are doing this in Australia, like they said, like right now, they've sort of collected the main important ones and they're, you know, they're going after like the little hard to find ones, but like they're not as important. Like you could, you could resurrect a reef with half of those species for sure. Yeah, you get that pantsuit. Sorry, no. Um, <laughs> uh, what happened um, to the the sea urchins? Who's uh, going to be eating the algae on these reefs? Oh yeah, so I did. I actually deleted that slide for space, but um, Moat Marine Laboratory in Florida is raising. Uh, Caribbean king crabs, which are grazers, and they are not affected by disease. And I actually got to visit the world's luckiest king crab. Uh, he's called Big Red, and he lives in a tank with like dozens of other females. And his job is just to mate with the females and make more more crabs. And they hope to one day release enough onto the reef that they will have one per square meter, which is like a crazy high abundance. Uh, and so like they would both be able to graze down the algae and also be like a, a local fishery because they, they taste really good apparently. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Go ahead. Um, do they have a backup plan for all of the storage facilities? What if Florida gets hit by a direct hit by a hurricane? What will happen to all of their corals? That's a great question. Um, so every, every, um, every facility that has the corals does have evacuation plans. Uh, and so even a few years ago, they didn't, for example, at Moat Marine Lab, they didn't evacuate their corals before, oh God, what was the big hurricane that hit the Keys a few years yeah. ago? Ian. Um, and the corals were washed over the highway and just incredibly, some volunteers had stayed behind in this brick of a building they had and they plucked the corals <laughs> off the highway. Um, but that, that is like a thing of the past. So they do, they all have rescue plans. And because there's a lot of corals now in like, Denver, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts. So like they're hoping that even if there's like a direct hit on Florida, there's going to be backups everywhere else. Tom? Well, first of all, I think you left out the best part of the, uh, the, the crab story, which is your reference to them as goats of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder, I mean, I know this is beyond the scope of what you were doing in your thesis, but the, you know, just as you were talking about ecosystem services from the corals, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of all the low-lying island nations. Doesn't this act as a feedback for their, um, a negative feedback for their resistance to climate change? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On that cheery note. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Oh, regular. I have my notes.
All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fee Jacobs. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. And the topic of my thesis is abortion beyond the binary. Transgender people have historically been left out of abortion and reproductive health research. But now two researchers are helping bring their experiences to light. Now, before I get started, I do want to warn you that my presentation deals with a couple of upsetting topics, uh, as is probably evident. Um, uh, sexual assault, self-harm, suicide, and abortion. Um, if you don't feel comfortable hearing about these topics, I promise I won't be offended if you need to step out. Your mental health should be a priority. Uh, I know that's ridiculous for me to say, considering I'm a graduate student and my mental health is always the lowest priority. <laughs> so the question that, that you're all probably wondering is, this sounds like a really depressing topic. Why did Fee decide to spend the last eight months uh, researching and writing about it? Well, there are a couple of reasons. This is a picture of me on my very first day of high school, way back in 2014. As you can see from this uh, truly phenomenal outfit, I obviously considered myself to be the height of fashion. Uh, and a couple months before this photograph was taken, I had started identifying as transgender. Uh, specifically, I came out as non-binary and I started using they, them pronouns. So trans rights and trans healthcare are obviously very personally important to me. Uh, but I also thought that as a trans journalist, I had a unique perspective on this topic that another writer might not be able to offer. I also ultimately decided to write my thesis on this subject because it was and continues to be extremely newsworthy. As you all know, reproductive rights in America are under attack. This past summer, the United States Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, ending the constitutional right to abortion. Over the past several months, access to abortion services has become increasingly restricted in many states. At the same time, we're also seeing an increase in local and state laws that restrict or eliminate rights for trans people. This past March, for instance, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill commonly referred to as Don't Say Gay, which bans discussion of sexual orientation and gender identity in public schools. In addition, almost 20 US states have now passed legislation restricting access to gender affirming care for trans children, and in some cases, trans adults. Now, as many activists have pointed out, these two trends are very much related. The right wing politicians who are restricting access to abortion are the same people seeking to limit the rights of trans Americans. And the fight for trans liberation, like the fight for reproductive justice, is fundamentally a fight for bodily autonomy and medical privacy. So after the fall of Roe, uh, some activists sought to unite these two movements by making the conversation surrounding abortion more inclusive of trans people. For example, using phrases like birth parent instead of birth mother or other gender neutral terms. Uh, and for some reason, this really pissed a lot of people off. Uh, for instance, a journalist uh, called uh, Helen Lewis wrote this remarkably tone deaf article for the Atlantic, uh, ranting about the use of gender neutral terms like pregnant people and even accusing the political left of declaring a war on saying women. Bette Midler decided to weigh in for some reason. She was retweeted by JK Rowling, a formerly beloved children's book author <laughs> and now noted transphobe. Now, a lot of these critics essentially said the same thing. The vast majority of people who get pregnant and need abortions are cisgender women. That is, women who were assigned female at birth and continue to identify as such. Now, the focus, according to people like Bette Midler and Helen Lewis, should be on these women and not on the comparatively small percentage of Americans who identify as trans. Now, the biggest problem with this argument is that it's actually completely possible to focus on both those groups of people, uh, including trans people in discussions of reproductive rights doesn't mean cis women are somehow excluded and acknowledging that some groups of people face unique struggles doesn't erase anyone else's. Intersectional feminists have pointed out that black women and women living in poverty are more affected by abortion bans than white wealthy women, and the same holds true for trans Americans. Something that really bothers me about people like Helen Lewis and Bette Midler is the way they treat this whole debate about gender neutral language like it's a question of just hurt feelings or appearing woke. But the assumption that abortion is a women's issue can actually have serious consequences for trans people. And as I began doing research for my thesis, I realized that part of the reason people don't consider these consequences is because 
we know next to nothing about the abortion experiences of trans people. We don't know how many trans Americans get abortions. We don't know what kinds of abortions they get. We don't know what challenges they face obtaining them, although we can make some assumptions. The data simply doesn't exist. So at this point, I was feeling pretty discouraged. After all, this is MIT's graduate program in science writing. I was finding zero science. Uh, but just as I was beginning to think I'd need to find a different topic, I stumbled upon a project being conducted at IBIS Reproductive Health, which is an organization that uses academic research in concert with traditional activism to help advance reproductive rights. Uh, and researchers at the Oakland office had developed the very first national level survey into the reproductive health experiences of trans Americans. I found my thesis topic, so the hard part was over. Uh, now I just needed to, you know, write it. So this is Hi Dr. Heidi Moseson. She is an epidemiologist and public health expert and the lead researcher in charge of this project. Now, Dr. Moseson's early work focused on documenting abortion in uh, cis women, which is notoriously a very hard topic to research. Um, abortion is an extremely common medical procedure, but the stigma that surrounds it often makes people hesitant to talk about their experiences with researchers. Of course, the same can be said for trans people who've historically been discriminated against and pathologized by researchers and healthcare providers. So when Dr. Moseson joined IBIS in 2017, she quickly noticed there was a considerable gap in knowledge when it came to the reproductive health experiences of trans people. She applied for a grant to conduct a small initial study, which involved just 30 participants. They reported experiencing a wide range of barriers to care, including high cost of treatment, lack of insurance, and lack of provider knowledge, all of which were compound, compounded by transphobic discrimination and stigma. They all agreed that more research was needed. So according to the most recent estimate by the Williams Institute at UCLA, approximately one and a half million Americans identify as trans. But up until recently, this population has been pretty much all but invisible to the reproductive health research community. In fact, when the Williams Institute published its first estimate in 2015, there were only two major studies that documented trans health at all. There was the PRIDE study, which was the first long-term national health study of uh, LGBTQ people, and the U.S. Transgender Survey, or USTS, which was the largest study ever devoted to the lives and experiences of trans people. Now, neither of these studies explicitly focused on reproductive health, but they did provide insight into some of the more overarching challenges trans people face when accessing health care. For example, the USTS found that trans Americans are more likely than cis Americans to live in poverty, uh, more likely to be unemployed, less likely to have health insurance, and uh, more likely to be victims of sexual assault, all of which can affect their need to access reproductive health services um, and their ability to access it. Even when trans people can afford quality health insurance, they often face challenges getting their insurance to cover certain procedures. Many are denied care for services considered gender specific, such as pap smears, prostate exams, and mammograms. Uh, although this type of denial is technically illegal, reversing it can be arduous, and any delays concerning insurance can have major health consequences. Now, Dr. Moseson explained to me that these insurance denials are actually a result of the way the American electronic medical billing system works. Uh, this system, which is used by hospitals and insurance companies throughout the US, uses deeply gendered language, which can make it impossible to accurately bill a trans person for procedures or treatments that are traditionally regarded as being exclusive to men or women. And of course, many trans people have had negative experiences with healthcare providers, harassment, refusal of treatment, uh, and providers who simply don't know how to treat them. Uh, doctors often don't have a clear picture of the specific healthcare needs and challenges of trans people, mainly because they just don't receive training about it in medical school. And the reason they don't receive that training is because there's no material to teach. There's no data. So Dr. Moseson went about designing a national level survey to help fill in these gaps in knowledge, but she quickly ran into a problem. The majority of traditional questionnaires and survey materials that researchers use to study reproductive health contain built-in assumptions about the gender and sexuality of respondents. These surveys regularly presume, for example, that anyone capable of pregnancy identifies as a woman, and they often confuse gender identity and sexual orientation. 
In addition, these studies were designed without any input from actual trans people. So Moseson realized that if her team wanted to conduct a survey that accounted for the specific needs of trans participants, they would essentially need to reinvent the wheel, design the study themselves from the ground up, and she would need to directly collaborate with trans researchers. That's how Sashiko Ragosta, a non-binary sex educator and writer, ended up as the project's senior research coordinator. Now, Ragosta is actually a big part of the reason I decided to write my thesis on this project, since I'd never seen a trans person acting in a leadership role in this type of study before. So I interviewed a lot of different sources for my thesis, uh, including uh, researchers, healthcare professionals who either identify as trans or work on issues surrounding trans health. But something that I really wanted to do with this piece was center the voices of trans patients. I interviewed several different patients, but for today, I'm gonna to focus on the three who feature the most prominently in my thesis. And you'll notice uh, that their stories reflect a lot of the larger issues trans people face trying to access reproductive health care. Things like lack of insurance, discrimination, and lack of provider knowledge. One person I interviewed was Stan Midwood, a non-binary individual who uses the neo-pronouns hey, hem, hez. Um, a few months before Stan got an abortion, he was fired from his job after reporting an incident of transphobic harassment from a coworker. Losing this job meant that Stan not only lost income, but also lost health insurance, which made it very difficult to pay for the abortion. Stan also suffers from a number of chronic illnesses, so the loss of health insurance came as a major blow for that reason as well. Stan also shared a story with me that I think really demonstrates how the plight of trans people is intrinsically linked to that of cis women in medicine, and also shows how vital it is that healthcare providers know how to treat patients of all gender identities. A few years after getting an abortion, Stan went to the emergency room complaining of abdominal pain. A nurse attempted to dismiss his symptoms as menstrual cramps, uh, just part of being a woman, um, and send Stan home. If she'd looked at Stan's chart, however, she would have known that he'd they had actually gotten a hysterectomy uh, a few years before and no longer got a period. As it turned out, Stan actually had a GI bleed, which could have been fatal if left untreated. Another person I interviewed was Kazembe Jackson, a trans activist from Atlanta. And we talked a lot about how class plays a role in abortion access. Kazembe became pregnant in 2001 after being abducted and raped by four men. And like many other trans people, he could not rely on his family for emotional or financial support. In fact, when he told his mother what had happened, she told him that the rape and pregnancy were a punishment from God for living a queer lifestyle. Uh, abortion funds weren't common at the time, so Kazembe took out a high interest payday loan. Uh, he spent the next six months paying it off. Um, and even though the initial abortion procedure had only cost $300, the loan ended up costing him close to 1000 the last person I want to mention is Jack Kemi Gutierrez, a non-binary writer currently living in Hollywood. Uh, Jack began identifying as non-binary in 2011, and a few months later found himself in need of an abortion. Jack faced many of the same problems as Stan and Kazembe when it came to affording their abortion, but the experience was also physically and emotionally arduous. Jack experiences a lot of something called gender dysphoria, which is a sense of distress stemming from a mismatch between one's assigned sex at birth and one's gender identity. Pregnancy would have been a massive source of dysphoria for Jack, but getting an abortion ended up being not much better. When I spoke with Jack, I was immediately struck by their humor and charisma, even when talking about such a difficult topic. Uh, I ended up devoting the first section of my thesis to their story. Uh, I'd like to share some excerpts of that section now. After pushing past anti-abortion protesters outside of Planned Parenthood, Gutierrez found that the intake forms didn't have a spot to list preferred names and pronouns. They cringed when clinic staff referred to them using feminine terms like girl and miss. But the worst moment came when Gutierrez learned that, due to a state law passed earlier that year, a transvaginal ultrasound was required before proceeding with the abortion. Gutierrez had taken conscious steps to avoid anything they thought might trigger dysphoria. They'd opted for a medication abortion, a procedure that involves taking medication to end pregnancy, as opposed to a more invasive surgical abortion in which suction is used to empty the uterus. The ultrasound, a procedure that is not medically necessary and is only required in 10 states, felt violating and made Gutierrez hyper aware of their uterus and ovaries. 
Well, Gutierrez was still in stirrups, the doctor, bound by legal obligation, offered them a printout of the ultrasound. The medication abortion itself was also far more arduous than they'd expected. For months, they endured nausea, cramping, and bleeding so severe they were forced to quit their job. In addition to the physical pain, every excruciating cramp and wave of nausea served as a reminder of body parts Gutierrez usually did their best to ignore. Gutierrez characterizes their abortion as the best thing I could have done for myself. But the experience of getting one as a trans person, along with other bad experiences seeking medical care in the years since, has made Gutierrez wary of medicine. They don't go to the doctor unless it's an emergency and haven't seen a dentist for almost 10 years. They know that not seeking health care could put them in serious danger. Their most recent pap smear detected potentially cancerous cells on their cervix, but Gutierrez refuses to return to the gynecologist for further testing. For them, the known misery of being trans at the doctor's office outweighs the potential risk of a deadly disease. For all I know, I have cervical cancer, they say. Cancer runs in my family on both sides. So Stan Kazembe and Jack's stories are incredibly important. Talking about your abortion is very taboo, and Kazembe told me that it's especially stigmatized in the trans community. The fact that these people are willing to speak openly about their experiences is vital. The only problem is that while individual stories are compelling and help put a face and name to an issue, stories alone can't drive change at the institutional level. For that, you need data. Heidi Moseson and Sashiko Ragosta were determined to obtain that data, make sure it was as thorough and accurate as possible, and use it to then elevate the voices of trans people. It took them an entire year, from May 2018 to April 2019, just to design the study. It included 328 questions and was completed by more than 3,000 people. With this study, Moseson and Ragosta were able to do what no researcher had done before. They showed that trans Americans get abortions and provided information about how many and what type of abortions they receive. They also confirmed what people in the trans community have been saying all along, that trans people face unique challenges when it comes to accessing reproductive health care, including abortion. These challenges are exacerbated by the assumption that reproductive health is simply a women's issue. Moseson and Ragosta also found that trans Americans who are faced with overwhelming barriers to access are more likely than cis women to attempt dangerous at-home abortions. Respondents reported using a wide variety of methods in an attempt to terminate their pregnancies, including many dangerous ones. As one respondent wrote, dying was a better alternative to forced pregnancy. Respondents described a range of reasons for attempting to end their pregnancy without clinical help. Lack of health insurance, restrictive laws, and transphobia from healthcare providers. As, a, as you can all probably imagine, the overturning of Roe v. Wade will only exacerbate these issues, especially when right-wing politicians across the United States are trying their very best to criminalize trans people for simply existing. The big question, of course, is where do we go from here? On one hand, Moseson and Ragosta's work has definitely paved the way for better, more inclusive research into trans healthcare experiences. The response to the survey from participants was overwhelmingly positive. As one respondent wrote, I can't tell you how much it means that you've taken such obvious and extensive efforts to be inclusive. Of course, there was room for improvement. Respondents noted a couple of issues with this survey that represent future avenues of research. In terms of next steps, Moseson and Ragosta hope to use their data to create better educational materials for trans patients, as well as more inclusive clinical care guidelines for the healthcare providers who treat them, providing tangible help to trans patients seeking reproductive health care. To achieve these goals, the team will, of course, need time and funding, but they also hope their work will help raise public awareness of trans health and fight for institutional change. And for that to happen, the voices of trans researchers like Ragosta and trans patients like Jack need to be amplified. I spoke with a lot of researchers studying this topic. Uh, many of our conversations ended the same way. I'd tell them how exciting and important I thought their work was, and they would tell me how happy they were that I was taking the time to write about it. So in other words, if I don't end up getting this thesis published somewhere, a lot of people are going to be very disappointed in me, <laughs> um, which is pretty solid motivation. <laughs> So before I wrap up, uh, oh, I don't know why he showed up. <laughs> You're like the third person on the list. <laughs> but anyway, 
Before I wrap up, there are a couple of people I'd like to thank. I'm just going to put them all up on the screen. <laughs> uh, first of all, a huge thank you to my amazing thesis advisor, Chris, uh, who made sure that I actually wrote a thesis uh, and is also just one of the best human beings I've ever met. Helped me get my internship this summer is amazing. Like, everybody give her $10 at the end of this. <laughs> um, also, thank you to Alan Lightman, who is invaluable as a second reader for my thesis and also is a phenomenal professor. Uh, thank you to Seth um, for letting me into this program in the first place. Um, this has been uh, such an amazing experience. I'm so grateful I got the chance to be here. Thank you, Shannon. You and your uh, office candies were on more occasions than I'd uh, like to admit, the only thing standing between me and a complete mental breakdown. <laughs> Uh, I also want to thank my beautiful girlfriend, India, who stayed up late with me as I worked on this thesis and also provided me with reassurance that I wasn't actually a fraud and terrible writer. And of course, thank you to the other members of the cohort who physically workshopped my thesis and also provided emotional support for me the rest of the time. I'm so glad I was able to meet all of you and become your friend. Finally, I want to thank the people I interviewed for this project. I'm so incredibly grateful that so many researchers and patients trusted me with their stories. I really hope I've done them justice. Thank you. Yep. Um, you mentioned sort of at the beginning, you're at the very beginning that like this is such a challenging topic and I know for you, especially a personal one, was it difficult like living in that world so distinctly for 12 months almost, eight months at least? Yeah, definitely. Um, as I mentioned, one of the sort of shining lights of this and uh, was Jack, uh, who I had gone into my initial interview with them, uh, expecting it to be really heavy. Um, you know, this is a, a very difficult and painful topic. Um, but they had been telling their story openly for many years and were able to look at it with a lot of humor. Um, and uh, that really sort of uh, having them as a focal point in the thesis really, really helped make it not just super depressing all the time. <laughs> That's just sort of a follow up to, to Will's question. Um, you did mention that, you know, as a graduate student, mental health is, is, is not a top priority, but I think, it, and also like in the journalism world, actually, you know, but I think it's a very important thing to, to consider as journalists, our mental health are very important. So like, then this, requires a lot of energy and all of that. I think what I would say is how can journalists who are interested in reporting this kind of stories really deal, learn to deal with some of this trauma and that they are going to be hearing and ex from the experiences of people? Um, I know I already thanked Chris for in general, but uh, one of the specific things that she helped me with is uh, in her experience, she also does a lot of this type of reporting, um, talking to vulnerable sources. And there are like specific websites and like standards and guidelines for doing that kind of reporting, but it also just really helps to have someone to talk through that with too. Um, it's also really helped uh, having this piece be workshopped by a group of other journalists. Uh, it's never good to just work on a piece by yourself. Um, you need people to have other eyes on it to help you craft the narrative, but also to check in with you. So I would say a having a community of other journalists was really helpful. Um, you mentioned that now that they're starting to get data, the IBIS Institute wants to like turn that into projects um, for various medical social justice. Are there any particular projects in their future that they have planned? Um, at the moment, no, they, I know that they, uh, they didn't want me to put this in the piece, um, so keep this hush-hush, but uh, uh, they, they have received more funding to do more research. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, they are hoping to, you know, create these uh, materials. And also, um, this isn't IBIS, but um, you remember the USTS, the U.S. National Trans Survey? Uh, they are actually um, getting ready to launch their second version, which actually includes a whole portion on reproductive health. Um, so I, I the, the IBIS, uh, collaborated with the Williams Institute and the Pride Study, um, and I imagine also will be collaborating with uh, other researchers going forward. Yeah. The, um, I mean, thanks for this uh, amazing piece of work. It's, it's you know, important and your presentation was just incredibly sharp. Um, I was struck by, you know, sort of a constant, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit theme which is basically the medical system is completely unequipped to handle these issues. 
and you you said at one point that it you know it sort of, it starts in medical schools. I'm wondering. I mean, I know you've just sort of answered this question, but I I'm wondering if there's any sort of systematic thought on you know what series of reforms would be needed to to uh, make um, you know the the medical structure, the medical institutional structure, uh, at least up to you know minimal competence in this area. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, starting in medical school, um, I can't remember, uh, this is, this data is probably out of date because I think the study was from 2011, but um, there was research that found that like on average medical students in like, think how many hours it takes to become a medical student. That's thousands of hours. They get like five hours of teaching on how to treat queer patients. So simply having more time spent, and also they don't get a lot of uh, teaching on reproductive health uh, unless they are like specifically specializing in it. Um, but, you know, PCPs need to know how to treat uh, reproductive health problems um, because some, they're sometimes the only doctor a patient sees. Um, and in terms of other sort of institutional change, um, continuing education for doctors, continuing training is important. I spoke to someone who's a patient advocate at Fenway Health, which is a, uh, trans health um, organization in Massachusetts, in Fenway. Um, and uh, they pointed out to me that um, doctors uh, do, you know, receive this education, but it's often they can opt out. Um, making that training a requirement could be a huge help. And also just giving more funding. The doctors are stretched thin. Um, often they're seeing patients on Medicaid. Um, and so they are seeing tons of patients because the patients can't go anywhere else. So, you know, expanding health insurance benefits, um, letting more people become doctors, uh, letting more trans people become doctors, making medical school more accepting for uh, trans people who wish to go into that field. Um, I know that's like a lot. Um, and this is, <laughs> this study represents just a sort of a small portion of the, the, the push to make those broader systemic changes. All right, thank you. Very quick five minute break, and then we're going to kick it off. Presentation. So, you did. Is that next? No. Did I ever tell you about? working on it Elsevier when I did my internship there. No. So they were making this simulation. I think it was for nursing students. It was definitely for a medical student of some type. But you would basically like have a simulation, which is kind of like I'm really glad, you know, we had this five minute break. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because these are both very intense topics. And I am going to be talking about tuberculosis. And we all might probably be experiencing some alcoholic feelings as well. So, um, but I promise you that I will try my best to make it as easy as possible. And also like just after this presentation, you're going to be hearing about really cool stuff like forests with eyes and sounds of chickadees and you know, so many cool sounds of our planet. So, um, but before I start, I would also just like to take a moment to really thank, uh, profoundly thank all of you and also um, some people who are watching virtually and cheering me up, Siri, Amy, and Shraddha, and also Don, who is here in person, one of the professors in my elective class this semester. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, so I would like to begin by throwing a question to the room. I wonder if there is anyone in the room who has had their loved ones infected with tuberculosis, TB. Okay, no one. Well, this is not surprising to me at all because tuberculosis is, is a disease that has been curable for the past 70 years. And in the United States, it has been successfully eliminated and in so many other um, Western educated, industrialized, rich, developed countries. So TB is no longer a problem. But what the picture that you're viewing right now uh, in the screen, they, these are tiny houses, like tiny apartments with these rooftops and big flaps um, to let in fresh air. And they were built in the early 1900s uh, at the foot of um, mountains in this area called Banning in California. And so in, in the early 1900s, when people get infected with TB, they moved into these tiny houses. 
because it was believed at the time that the favorable climate uh, and also like fresh air cured the highly contagious infection. So people move in and they pay about $80 per month and some get better and, and heal. Well, a lot of people died from, from the infection. Before I tell you more about the haunting past of this disease and why, you know, and its threat to humanity today, I was born and grew up in Nigeria in West Africa and in 2018, after I completed my undergraduate degree in biochemistry, I decided to volunteer for the Nigerian Air Force Medical Corps for one year. So I was posted to the northern Nigerian city of Jos, and I was posted to a hospital there. And when I got to the hospital and they were giving me kind of a tour of the hospital and looking for where to assign me, and I saw this small office and there, it was signed post TB dot. So, I asked them, what do you do here? And they said, well, we keep all the drugs and all the records of TB patients in this office. And whenever they come around to take their drugs, we, we come and open the office and then we give them their treatments and they go back home. But the DOT means um, directly ob observed therapy. So it is a World Health Organization recommendation that you know, ideally these patients should sit together with a healthcare provider in the office and sort of support them to take these drugs because these are like it's it's a cocktail of drugs about 27 pills every day so and they take them over like a nine month regimen or in some cases one year or even up to two years so i told them you know what i would like to stay in this office for the whole year so they cleaned up the office and i stayed there and these patients will come in and i'll give them their drugs and they will leave um, but sometimes I will pick up my phone and then I will call them up if I didn't see them, if they didn't show up. And some of them would tell me that they didn't have money for transportation, so they couldn't um, come to the clinic to take their drugs. Um, I tried when I could to help, but obviously I couldn't help everyone. So, so why should you care about TB? It's, uh, thankfully, no one in this room has, has you know, uh, has had anyone or experience TB, but why should you care about it? So I don't want to bore you with figures and numbers, uh, not because I'm terrible at mathematics, <laughs> which is rightly so, you know, but this is MIT, we, we love to crunch numbers. So I would like to give you some figures. Um, roughly 4,000 people died from tuberculosis yesterday on our planet. So. This makes TB the global leading infectious disease killer today. And when I came to MIT, I really wanted to research and write about this topic and to understand why is such a curable disease, why is such a disease that is treatable just so hard to eliminate, and why is it killing millions of people? So first stop, my reporting took me to Los Angeles, California, where those tiny houses, uh, apartments, were built in the early 1900s. And I visited a cemetery called the Inglewood Park Cemetery, and that is just um, a side view of, of that cemetery. It's a really vast and beautiful cemetery. Um, in the course of my research for this story, I had found names of people who died from TB more than 100 years ago in the US, and they were buried in the cemetery. And one of them was Don Crumpet. Um, he died in 1914, and he was buried in the cemetery, and I was able to locate his grave. So I'm just going to read um, a section of my thesis about, about um, this cemetery and what I found out um, about Don Clampett. On a warm sunny day in Los Angeles, the air is smogless and warm. In Inglewood Park Cemetery, carpets of grass shimmer opulently along the smooth tarred roads of the cemetery. The footpaths are flanked by palm trees like rows of lampposts. As the afternoon breeze sighs, a mournful crowd gathers near a mausoleum in the cemetery. Since 1905, it's been the final resting place of thousands of Americans, including the singer-songwriter Ray Charles. But the vast, hauntingly beautiful cemetery, 
also called the soul of the city of angels, illuminates more than just the mortality of the great and the powerful. Because alongside the music stars, there are graves that tell a sadder, grander story. On the 7th of May in 1914, a man who lived in Ban in near Los Angeles died. He too was buried at the Inglewood Park Cemetery. Don Clampett had contracted a deadly disease around 1902. The culprit, according to, his death, according to his death records, was pulmonary tuberculosis. As the disease tore through communities in America, it killed tens of thousands of people and left families devastated. Stories about the cure also spread across the nation. Railway companies extensively publicized favorable climates in Western states, including Los Angeles, as heavens that could, as heavens that could cure the highly contagious infection. In 1913, Clampitt made the journey to Bannon with his family, hoping to improve his health. Along with other people infected with tuberculosis, he was admitted for treatment at the Southern Sierra Sanatoria. Small houses built near the mountains with rooftops and big flaps in the sides to let in fresh air. Some patients at the sanatoriums got better, but Clampitt wasn't one of them. The ferocious killer consumed him. The disease known as tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. When someone infected with active tuberculosis speaks, sneezes, or coughs, they release TB bacteria in thousands of tiny moist droplets that hang in the air for several hours. Once a bystander breathes in this airborne bacteria, they come down with TB. Left with no treatment, TB advances. It attacks the lungs, causing severe damage that heralds weakness and other respiratory complications. Next is a hacking, racking cough. If the infection spills into the bloodstream, it spreads to other vital organs of the body, including the brain, kidney, and spine. Amid the debilitating pain and coughs that bring up blood, the body begins to melt away. When the end comes, patients die in torment, unable to breathe. Clampitt died more than 100 years ago, but tuberculosis still rages, killing one person nearly every 20 seconds the global leading killer among infectious diseases today, despite the invention of antibiotics that can combat it. So generally, there are two ways that countries and researchers have been trying to fight TB. There's already a vaccine against tuberculosis called the BCG vaccine, but this vaccine has been in existence for more than 100 years. And also there are the drug regimens that I told you which have been there for like the past 15 years, they've, 50 years, there have been no new drugs until now. So also it is, you know, it, it's still really difficult to eradicate this disease globally. And that's why it makes sense for, for the world to have new interventions and new tools, including new vaccines and also diagnostics to, to be able to eliminate this disease. And this is where the story of Muriel Kamariza comes in, um, just 15 minutes drive from the cemetery that, that I told you about, after I spent the afternoon, you know, saying hello to Ray Charles and <laughs> to them clamping. I, the next morning I was at Muriel Kamariza's lab at, at UC and she's an assistant professor. And for the past couple of years, she has been trying to develop new diagnostics that can test for TB rapidly, and especially in poor developing countries where this disease is endemic. She's originally from Burundi herself, and she had had family members and relatives who have been infected by TB and, and died of tuberculosis. So um, just after the, uh, a really bloody civil war in Burundi, she moved to the US, and she went to UC San Diego, had her BSc in chemistry and biochemistry, and then she went to Stanford. And at Stanford, she, she was um, at Caroline Bartosi's lab. Caroline Bartosi won the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. And she, they were, that lab had already understood, they were already studying some of the molecules, the, the cell wall of this bacteria. So she had already, they had already understood how these molecules work, and especially they had identified um, a molecule called trehalose that helps this bacteria to build its cell wall. So they understood this molecule very well, and when Mireille came in, what she, what she did was, okay, 
can we develop a dye, a compound that can actually bind to this molecule such that when this uh, compound binds to, to, to this molecule that helps the bacteria build its cell wall in the process of doing that, it can light up and we can be able to see this bacteria and we can detect it in real quick time. Because a lot of the tests that we have for TB, for example, one of the tests is called the ZN test. It has been there for more than 50 years and it, it's really cumbersome and it's time consuming. So Mireille was able to do that. And in 2016, they published their first paper. They, they, uh, in 2016, she actually flew to South Africa, which has one of the highest burdens of TB and tested the, the, the probes in, you know, in, in people infected with the disease. And when she did that, they published their first paper and that went really well. And uh, we spoke recently as I was just completing my thesis and she told me that they are now working on expanding and launching bigger trials in countries like Kenya and Vietnam and Uganda where there's really high burden of uh, TB. And so while Muriel is working on you know, promising tools to diagnose TB, other researchers have been trying to investigate um, what do we do after diagnosing TB? And especially the, the, they're trying to understand, they're trying to like investigate new vaccines. And this is where Tom Scriber comes in. And Tom is the director of the South African TB Vaccine Initiative. And he's a clinical immuno uh, immunologist and he has been researching um, TB vaccines for the past 20 years. He's been involved in more than 30 clinical trials. But the, his work has been bedeviled by the complexity of this bacteria and the disease. And, you know, part of the problem is that because when, when TB successfully established itself in the lungs, it can actually remain there dormant for like the entire lifetime of an individual. So it takes time for the symptoms for, to, for some people to develop active TB and some don't even develop active TB at all. So that quirk of biology has been one of the main uh, hurdles for, for Tom. And the reason is that it makes clinical trials really slow because it takes time, this, this bacteria takes time to, to, to develop, to, to, to become like active in people who are infected with it. And it makes the trials slow, it makes the trials chronic. And also at the same time, there's just no funding for, for research for this disease. And I'm going to tell you why. So this is, um, a picture of an area in Cape Town, South Africa. And, you know, on the right-hand side of this large green area, these houses, are, you can see like really rich white neighborhoods, um, child roads, and on the left-hand side, uh, areas that are communities that are really cramped. And in these communities that, and households that are cramped, you have high level of TB and TB transmission. And at the same time, also HIV, because South Africa has one of the highest cases of HIV in the world. So because these two diseases, HIV and, and TB, travel together, a lot of the stigma for HIV is transferred to TB. And so as a result, people who are infected with TB are highly stigmatized against. And when you have a disease that is being stigmatized, when you have um, the disadvantage of having, living with a disease that is being stigmatized, the disease continues to spread. Despite, despite scientists' uh, best efforts. But most importantly, what I want to highlight with this is the fact that, you know, it's really this div divide and inequality uh, in our healthcare systems because TB has been successfully eradicated in rich countries. It is no longer a problem here and no one cares about TB. So it kind of has the cases, it, it, it only worsened the case the cases of this disease in poor countries where it is endemic. So this is just uh, one of the initiatives that I found in the, in the process of writing this thesis. It's called, uh, it's, it's an initiative they are based in Cape Town, South Africa called EWOSA. And what they do is they basically just re uh, recruit teenagers, secondary school students, and they teach them how to make documentaries and films 
about TB and HIV and other infectious diseases. And they produce these documentaries in local South African languages, and they use them to raise awareness and also to help dis, um, destigmatize against, against the disease. Yeah, so um, I would like to leave you with a few conclusions. Um, personally, one of the, one of the hardest things uh, for me in writing this thesis was trying to really end it on a really hopeful note. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really difficult <laughs> to do that because, you know, you can have all this science going on. We can have Muriel, we can have Tom, we can have all these people working on this uh, really promising ideas, but you have these social and economic barriers that really prevent people affected with this disease uh, from accessing treatments and from getting better. So science hangs in the balance. And, you know, I really hate to, I dislike associating this disease as the disease of the poor, because then we keep on adding more stigma to it and sort of really stereotyping people who are infected with this disease. Because from my reporting from, and from my experience, John Clampett wasn't a poor man. He came from a very rich family and he was infected by TB and he died because at that time, there were better antibiotics to treat the, the disease. And now in this part of the world, it has been eradicated. No one cares about it. So I think we really need to um, have better systems, better healthcare systems that put you know, people at the center uh, and not the disease of whatever we are designing in the current healthcare systems that we have. Um, yeah, so on a final note, I will say that for, for Mireille and for Tom, I, I, I spoke with Tom um, when I was finalizing my thesis as well, and he told me that he's still hopeful that by the end of the decade, there, there might be, we will have a vaccine on the shelf against TB. Um, yeah, I would like to really profoundly Thank you all, um, the, the program, and especially my thesis advisor, Nikki. Um, when I visited the Inglewood Park Cemetery and I called her and I'm like, wow, because like, and she's like, yeah, you can go in. People can walk into cemeteries and it's because it was really beautiful. <laughs> and, and I've never like really experienced like going into a cemetery and just taking a walk. <laughs> And also like all my sources, my families and friends, Siri, Amy, and all of them who are online. Um, thank you so much, Shannon. Um, it's always a pleasure to drop by in your office and, and Shannon will always be like, ask me harder questions next time. <laughs> 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 and, and I really want to thank, um, I call them my uh, science wabras. Uh, <laughs> all my classmates, you, you are the, the bravest of all elephants, and you, you are the wisest of all uh, elephants, the bravest of all beavers, and the toughest of the tech. Thank you. Got a question, but a comment from the audience. Fantastic presentation, Abdullahi. Such a profoundly important point about why it's problematic to think of TB as a disease of the poor. This is from Siri Carpenter. <laughs> um, I also have another question that just popped up. Um, it was just announced this week that the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative is working with Biofabri on development of a live attenuated TB vaccine that would begin trials in 2024. I believe this is the only live TB vaccine in development at the time. Based on what you saw in your research, Abdullahi, does this seem like a promising approach to you? Yeah. Um, I think a couple of things. I also know that there's, there's, there's an mRNA vaccine trial that is coming up soon um, against TB. And also there's, for example, some drugs have, new drugs have come up. But for example, the new drug that, that, that just came up, the patent is still owned by G and J, and they don't want to give up the patent, you know, for these drugs, despite the fact that it's been there for like a decade now, and they don't want to give up the patent for this drug. 
And if these drugs are developed, the, the problem is the issue, the issue of access. The burden of this disease is in poor countries, you know. And from my own experience, I've met these people, some of these people infected with this disease, and they don't have money for transport to come to the clinic frequently and take these drugs. And just recently, as I was completing my thesis this March on World TV Day, and I zoomed into one of, one of the programs that the was organized, and they talked about they encouraged the people to take the treatments and they did all that. But someone on the in the audience still asked the same question. He said, well, thank you for telling us to take our drugs, but we don't have the money to keep on coming to the clinic. We don't have the money to buy food to take the drugs with. So like I said, we have to center whatever we're doing. We have to center the people at the heart of it and not the disease. So like not just developing these drugs for money, uh, for profits, as a lot of pharmaceutical companies, you know, that's, that's the top priority, I think, for them. So okay. <laughs> I, I, I just want to add that, you know, it's good to have like all these tools. Uh, um, I have two questions, so feel free to answer whichever one you'd rather. But um, <laughs> my first is you talked about um, the modern discrepancy between TB practically being eradicated in the United States and similar countries versus it being an active problem um, in underdeveloped countries. I was kind of wondering about like the history and how it got there. Um, and my second question was about this um, connected stigma between HIV and TB. TB is like spread through like respiratory droplets and stuff, whereas HIV is spread through like blood and reproductive fluids. So how did two diseases that like spread differently like that end up linked? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, when you're infected with HIV, the immune system is compromised. So it's, it's very easy to get infected with TB. So that's how the two are related, yeah. And in fact, a lot of the research uh, on TB tries as much as possible to, you, they, they always look at patients with HIV and TB and patients with just uh, tuberculosis. And back in the history, I would say, it, you know, in the history from what I read, it actually, you have people who, um, came with this disease from Europe, from India, through South Africa, and that's how you had the spread of the disease across across the, the continent. But it's been eliminated now in this part of the world, and it is a problem in the other part of the world. Okay. This is my question. <laughs> um, so I know that uh, Paul Farmer and his organization, Partners in Health, has had some success in Haiti with treating not just the disease, but providing a stipend for people so that they have the money to either get transportation to the clinic or um, buy food and clean water with which to take the medication. And I didn't know, is there is there an organization or an incipient organization like that for the South African um, area? Absolutely. So to be honest with you, even in the Nigerian case, there is this social grant that is supposed to be there for these patients. But unfortunately, there's a lot of corruption in the system. You know? So these people, they don't even actually tell the, reveal to the patients that they had access to that grant to, to help them with the transportation. Because the drugs are free. So if you're sick and you are poor and they say, okay, take these drugs for free, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask, probably you wouldn't want to ask about money for transportation. And these people, they just take, take, um, take that. So same with South Africa, I, I spoke, um, I had a really long conversation with Tasha who founded the WOSA. And she, she, she told me um, a little bit about some of the social grants available, but, um, the thing with South Africa is, is there's a lot of complications. Uh, the inequality is really high. Uh, the vestiges of apartheid uh, in South Africa just make so many things, uh, including the healthcare system, really complex. How did you keep yourself safe when you were dealing with patients uh, who had tuberculosis? 
in Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you always have to mark some. Honestly, I wanted to stay in that room because I just wanted a quiet place to write. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a quiet place to just like. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also at the same time, I was like, why can't just anyone stay here? I just wanted, because they actually took me to this like big room where they do like immunization for babies. I'm like, no, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. Again, this is a thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, yet another vital topic. And, and um, I'm just, uh, you know, it's true that TB rates are extremely low in the developed world while we're losing, you know, well over a million a year to the disease. Um, but uh, one of the things that strikes me is that, and I don't know if anybody talked about this, is that the actual barrier to TB reappearing in uh, areas where it appears to be eradicated or almost eradicated uh, seem very low. I mean, you have multiple or even, I mean, they don't call it total drug resistant, totally drug resistant disease anymore. They call it what, something like extremely drug resistant. But, you know, there, there are forms of the disease that would evade, you know, the standard treatments uh, in, you know, Cambridge as well as in, you know, Cape Town. Um, did anybody talk about how they, that, that, that and, and do you think that that, uh, that the, that the short short sightedness, even even from a point of view of self interest, the short sightedness of the developed world is uh, is it at play in this disease. Um, even in the United States, um, recently there are cases of multi drug resistant TB and extensively drug resistant TB, and this is a huge problem um, right now in the TB world. But like I mentioned, uh, some of the new drugs that have been developed now are targeted at the multi-drug resistant TB and the extensively drug resistant TB. Um, I think the only thing that I will add is, you know, I also talked a little bit about that quake of biology that this bacteria has. It has, you know, really made the bacteria so smart that it has continuously been able to like outsmart humans. And even when these drugs are developed, um, it keeps developing resistance. Uh, lunch will be here soon. Uh, in the meantime, do some mingling. Oh, <laughs> Uh, welcome. Zoom. It made me sound very ominous. For <laughs> I really liked it, and I wish that was my real voice. All right, somebody is in the webinar who has connected to audio. It was, it was me. Okay. <laughs> Keep the mic muted. We're doing great. We're doing great. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are going to kick off our post-lunch presentations with Dalen Brown. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Daylin Brown. I just recently graduated from Hampton University as from the Journalism and Communications School, so I do not have a science background here. I took investigative journalism at Hampton and I got into environmental justice. And that's basically looking at how the environment disproportionately hurts minorities, specifically black and brown communities. So my thesis is on what can be done to ensure another hurricane the size of Katrina will not destroy the entire city of New Orleans. So you're probably wondering, Hurricane Katrina, that was in 2005. So let me take a step back. I'm worried about Hurricane Katrina because in 2005, I was five years old. So that was my first newscast that I really remember. And when I was five years old, you know, 
there's five-year-olds who are afraid of monsters in the closet or monsters under their bed. But that was my biggest fear, seeing Hurricane Katrina on the news and seeing all those people stranded on the top of buildings while the city was just underwater. That was my biggest fear. But what made it so scary for me was that I saw so many Black people. That was the first time on the news that I had seen a news story that was a majority Black. And that's what was so scary to me. And that's when I was in my investigative reporting class doing some of these environmental justice stories where I would go into these neighborhoods that were causing cancer and had water that was polluted. And every time the best part of being in that neighborhood was that the Black people would say, you know, we really appreciate you actually caring about us. So that's when I wanted to look at what can be done about New Orleans. That is a predominantly Black city that was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. And that's why I had this connection and I thought, this is another set of Black people that would be so thankful for my work. So first I wanna show you what happened and what went wrong during Hurricane Katrina. So this is a picture of the map of the hurricane and storm damage risk reduction system. So during Hurricane Katrina, all these green lines that you see are different levees and canals that were built into New Orleans to make sure <laughs> that the water would not flood the city. And what happened was this entire system failed. There was levees that fell down, there was canals that got just stuck up by water, and some of the pumping stations just failed. And then, as you can see, here's a map a little bit closer of some of the neighborhoods that I'm looking at in New Orleans. So right here, this neighborhood has this small body of water, and when these levees failed, that body of water filled the entire neighborhood. And right around here, where you have the Mississippi River that flows through, that entire, that entire neighborhood got just destroyed by a body of water. So next, I wanna show you the first neighborhood that I showed you had the body of water behind it is the Lower Ninth Ward. So when I got to go to New Orleans to investigate, I took a video and as you can see, this is now 2023. We are now 18 years after Hurricane Katrina and you just see the emptiness of the neighborhood. You see that there are still houses that are destroyed. You see these open plains of just nothing. And that's what happened. Hurricane Katrina left this neighborhood with literally nothing. So the first stop when I went to New Orleans was the Bayou Bienvenue Wetlands Triangle. And so this wetland used to be a beautiful wetland that was a bayou filled with alligators, turtles, fish, and everything that you would see in the Louisiana cuisine. But then it did not end up that way. The problem was I talked to a coastal restoration member, Michael Byros, and he explained to me some of the things that went wrong with this bayou to then make it not be this beautiful place that was a vital resource for the community. So now I'm going to read you an excerpt from my thesis that pertains to this exact situation. Byros isn't sure that planting trees to restore this wet wetland can completely fix the flooding problem in the Lower Ninth Ward. Since the bayou is located at the back of the neighborhood, he said all the water comes to the edge of the bayou, then hits the levee that was built right behind the water. So it makes sense to put like the canal and the green infrastructure all in this area to absorb some of that extra water, said Byros. Combining these gray and green infrastructures is a small ex scale example of what may be the new approach for mitigating floodwaters in New Orleans. Byros thinks green infrastructure will accompany the Army Corps flood systems in a way that could successfully mitigate flooding because the hard infrastructure just isn't working with the New Orleans environment. He said, what it boils down to, in my mind, is connecting the types of infrastructure that we built to the landscape into ecological and social context. He explained that historically, the Army Corps had a way of engaging with the landscape that was heavy handed. It was very much like controlling the water from an engineering approach. He argues that any organization that wants to start any infrastructure for flood mitigation needs to take into consideration that this entire area is a delta. 
every single bit of sediment here that wasn't trucked in or shipped in somehow was brought here by a flood at some point, Byro said. So flooding is kind of a fundamental to our landscape. When levees and flood walls and other hard infrastructure that prevent flooding get built, there is a disconnect from foundational truth of what a delta is. But fortunately, now it seems that the Army Corps are understanding the consequences of building hard infrastructure in the, long, in the wrong location. Recently, they have been pushing an initiative that they call Engineering with Nature, and they have begun to build projects connected to ecological processes. Byro sees this as a step in the right direction to make sure New Orleans won't be put in more flood danger by new infrastructure. I'm not saying that there isn't a place for hard infrastructure because we can't reverse some of those decisions we've made in the past, said Byros, but we just need to find a way to live with them and to grow from them. So I wanna take a step back. I talked about in that excerpt, green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. So this is what the bayou looked like today when I went and decided to take a couple pictures of the terrible destruction of the bayou. So before, the bayou was this beautiful infrastructure, this bayou was this beautiful place that was filled with several ecosystems, but now it's this dead land. So the problem is, the reason it is so dead like this is because of saltwater intrusion from the lake just north of this bayou, Lake Ponchu Train. So that lake had salt water in it that then moved to this bayou that is fresh water. So when you have salt water moving into a fresh water area, the problem is that kills off the entire ecosystem. So as you see that really small pointy thing out of the bayou, that's a cypress tree. So what Byros wants to do is he wants to start green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is using nature to have to build walls in these levees to stop the water from coming into the neighborhood. So that small cypress tree, if they were to plant way more of them, they would act as levees. And so right now, the coastal restoration team has planted about 2,600 of these trees. So if all of them are now filled and this is able to be built back up, it would be great if that could be a levy for the entire community to stop some of that water. But the problem is, like Byru said, what I read, those trees can't do everything. So as you see, this is the bayou and in right in front of the neighborhood, if they were to put a canal there, then that would help because the bayou would stop some of that water and then the canal would be able to catch the rest of it. But as we saw during Hurricane Katrina, the canal can't catch all of it. So I want to take even more of a step back of what are nature-based solutions. So that's the green infrastructure I'm talking about. So it just started to come more into the first world as in 2015, 196 parties agreed on the International Treaty on Climate Change called the Paris Climate Agreement. So that means that they all decided, you know, we need to do something about this climate change problem that we all obviously see. So their answer was, how about implementing nature-based solutions? So in the island of Seychelles, there's a, it's made up of several small islands. And first, the small islands of Mehi and Praslin, they started to do what the bayou wants to do in New Orleans, which was restoring these wetlands. And they have seen success. They have had a much better time with flooding and managing flooding and this is something that we've seen as a successful solution. So hopefully New Orleans and the bayou there can follow suit. But the problem is here in the US, Biden has proposed this plan, but he hasn't necessarily shelled out the money to do so. So now New Orleans is basically relying on these nonprofits. So my next stop when I was in New Orleans was talking to Dana Ennis from the Urban Conservancy. So she is working on doing small nature-based solutions within the neighborhoods to help the flooding. So this is the Hoffman Triangle neighborhood, which I showed you is um, nor just north of the Mississippi River. So the river will easily flood this, and this was a neighborhood that was eight to 10 feet, had eight to 10 feet of water during Hurricane Katrina. So, when you see these rain gardens, 
they have about a thousand gallon capacity in each garden. So when you look at that, even though it looks like this is just such a small thing that wouldn't help anything, when you can hold a thousand gallons of water in each lawn, that is just incredibly helping the neighborhood. So then not only were the residents involved, but then also businesses were involved. So this is a picture of the parking lot of the Parkway Bakery. So normal parking lots we see here are just cement with a bunch of lines and you know, you park in a spot. But here, now we have what we call permeable pavement. When water can move through the pavement and not just sit on top of cement, you will then not have this flooding issue. So when this entire parking lot is about an acre of just ways that water cannot be flooding and filling up, that is so helpful to the community. And then also here, we have another restaurant that is called Dookie Chases, and it is known for having political figures come in during the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King sat there and ate there, and it has been just a pivotal part of the community in Louisiana. But the problem was, after Hurricane Katrina, this entire restaurant was underwater. And since it was so beloved to the community, this was the one thing that they said, we need to fix this. So what they did, as you can see in these bricks here, is start permeable pavement, because as you can see, there's a bit of a downhill slope. And the problem is, when this place floods and then the water goes out to the street, now you're just flooding the neighborhood also. So now with this permeable pavement, the water is able to go down and not flood the entire neighborhood. And then also you see more of the rain gardens, which we saw in the residents' lawns. And this is also helping just stop that water. So one of the last places that I went to was some of the churches in Louisiana. So New Orleans is filled with several Baptist churches. And just in the Hoffman Triangle, there is over a hundred small Baptist churches. So the churches understand how much of an impact they can make. So the great part is D Dana Ennis from the Urban Conservancy teamed up with this nonprofit association also called Thrive. And Thrive helps people that were young people that have been incarcerated or young people who are put in bad situations. It gives them a job and something to do. So for Thrive, Thrive had with Thrive worked with the Urban Conservancy to put in these beds and put in more permeable pavement. So at the church, we don't only have permeable pavement that is stopping the water from flooding the church, but it's also helping the neighborhood around it. But then also, as you see more of these little sticks that we saw in the bayou, those are cypress trees. Now, I went in January, so they were not green, they were not luscious, but once they are, each cypress tree can hold 800 gallons of water, which then goes directly back into the atmosphere from soil. So that's so helpful because now the neighborhood will not be flooded. So the question that I wanted to answer in my thesis is, will these nature-based solutions be sustainable for New Orleans? And what I've come to is yes, they will. But the problem is like Byros pointed out and Dana Ennis also agreed, they can't just do it on their own. Nature-based solutions won't save New Orleans by itself. But if we start using and implementing these nature-based solutions with what the Army Corps had done in the past, that together could help keep New Orleans afloat. So I just wanted to say thank you. I wanted to take a second to thank my mom and my uncle who are here. I have several people watching on Zoom. I know I have professors, my brother and my boyfriend. And I just want to thank them because not only is it hard to go to a city alone where you don't know anybody, but coming from Hampton University, it was HBCU. So this was a bit of a culture shock to me. Being in such a technical school in Cambridge where there's such a low minority rate, it was terrifying. And I dealt with a lot of discrimination. So I just thank the support system I had to get me through this. So thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so you talked about um, the combination of nature-based solutions and it sounds like federal intervention. Is the Army Corps of Engineer post-Katrina 
what are what are they doing? Because it was their system that failed, right? So are they what steps are they taking to sort of supplement what the community is doing? Yeah, so they're working with the um, now they're working with these nonprofit groups and the coastal restoration group, which is very helpful because they're seeing what they did was very much of an engineered approach. So they're seeing it from a green approach. So some of the things they're doing is trying to make sure that these levees don't keep subsiding the soil. So they're making sure that where they build the levee isn't going to cause more damage than help. So by doing that, they're working with environmentalists who understand how to use you know, the land. One more question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the rain garden. It looks like, so uh, those, um, are, are those all areas that had not been planted at all previously, or are those, it, it, are those areas where a specific type of vegetation is planted and that's why they can absorb so much water? <clears throat> yeah, so before, you know, I didn't put it all in my presentation, but part of my thesis was um, Dana Ennis really worked with this um, initiative called FYI Front Yard Initiative. So before, where these rain gardens were, it was just a full path of cement for a driveway, like, you know, our normal driveways look like. But instead, now they made the permeable pavement and then in front of their lawns where they would just have cement of a sidewalk, that's where they made sure to put these rain gardens in. So before it was just such a cement heavy neighborhood and now having those rain gardens, it just helps so much with the flooding. And you, you've done an amazing job and your, your thesis stands out, uh, I think, in, in, the, in the class because it's a solution story. And I wonder you came from an investigative background and you're in the science writing program. How do you feel about like, you know, merging that background with the science writing, uh, which what you've learned in the program, like you didn't have a science background, but you have this investigative background and sort of merging that and working on this really um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, perspective of journalism. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, having that investigative background was really helpful because it's just figuring out the questions to ask, who to talk to. I think a big thing when I went to New Orleans, what was very helpful was I had, um, you know, just that comfortability of interviewing people. So even with Dana Ennis, I felt like I was on an episode of Dateline. Like she <laughs> took me around the entire neighborhood. She drove me probably for hours, not only to that neighborhood, but going to churches and just showing me all these examples. So I think, and just having my camera with me so I could show you all these pretty examples too and hopefully include them in my thesis. So I think, yeah, just having that reporting background and really understanding what I needed to look for to find the solution. Also, also there, there's the Solutions Journalism Network. You probably know them, but I feel like, so they have like this big database of like, um, they call it solutions journalism tracker or something. And like all solution stories, they basically try to track all solution journalism stories. And I feel like this can neatly fit in there. And because the goal I think with solutions journalism is you want to show people that, you know, a, a lot of <clears throat> like in the media you see a lot of, it's, it's a lot of bad news and problems. But now here's a solution and it worked and it can also work somewhere else. So they, they try to track these stories with the goal that you know people can look them up and try to replicate these um, solutions and spread them. Yeah. I'll, I'll just uh, add to that that we won't know it's a real solution until there's another flood. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> we don't want to do that experiment, but that's. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, um, how did you, like, um, make connections with all these people in New Orleans before you went down there? The, like, traveling and coordinating with all these people in order to make everything line up must have been a challenge. I'm curious about that. Yeah, um, I think that's where, like, a lot of what Abdullahi said by investigative reporting helps because I just reached out to so many people. And then before going to New Orleans, I had so many phone calls to make. So I feel like I had gotten Dana Ennis's entire life story before I had even like got in her car. So it was like, okay, I guess now I do trust this stranger. Um, so yeah, and then Michael Byros, I had already worked with some coastal rec uh, restoration groups. So just making sure I had the right people for Louisiana, definitely some of my connections with the EPA from my 
past classes and some of my connections from Hampton really did help me with this story because I was able to make sure I was talking to the right people. Yes. You can, I mean, thank you. This was, um, it's so lovely to have some hope after. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> presentations were great, but <laughs> this is, this is, um, and, and I think, you know, you developed the story really well over, over, uh, over the course of the year. It was a, it was a complicated story to assemble. But one thing that, I mean, in just, just, you know, as you were presenting struck me is, is, um, you know, on the one hand, this is a very local set of solutions. And in your thesis, you talk about some wider issues, but I'm wondering also if there's a, that we're sort of in, you know, what Boston's doing and the question of, you know, funding from Congress and all that, you know, these are, those are sort of national scale issues or regional scale issues. Um, but the way you described Ennis and Biros and so forth, uh, it struck me that this is also a, a, a nationalizable or, or regionalizable grassroots level movement. And I'm wondering, you know, do you have a sense if, um, you know, people from Galveston or, you know, Mobile or, you know, other places that are along, uh, along the coast um, are, are taking notes on, learning from, connecting with the New Orleans effort? Because, I mean, of course, New Orleans is the focus because of Katrina. Yeah, so um, it was interesting because, well, New Orleans is the focus, but there are definitely coastal um, groups that are also helping. So Byros works with five other coastal restoration groups that kind of go even further east where you have some of those wetlands that are just small islands part of New Orleans. But it was interesting because um, when I was watching the news this morning, they were talking about New York and how they just found out that there's like 17,000 tons of, that's how much these skyscrapers are weighing down the city. So it was interesting because then they interviewed somebody from the Army Corps and when they were talking to the person from the Army Corps, he said, you know, but I'm going to check with environmentalists. Mm -hmm. So I think it is interesting that I feel like this will be used in other places like New York and like Boston and places that are in coastal danger. So I think this is a great microcosm example for what can be done. <laughs> As an undergrad, I studied ecology, so I wrote my thesis on the sleepless forest observers, which is what I think of as a major shift in ecology. So I want to start off with asking you all to close your eyes for a few seconds and picture an ecologist, someone that is researching how organisms interact with each other and their environments, is doing that research. Okay, open your eyes. <laughs> what did you all picture? What type of work was the ecologist doing? What is the research like? I'm imagining like going out into the field in their like mosquito net, collecting samples and getting, you know, their hands dirty out in the forest. Yeah, totally. Field work, like V said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw like hiking boots and cargo shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's what I think of as an ecologist too, and in undergrad mostly in my labs, like that's what I would do. But increasingly, ecologists aren't directly interacting with the organisms that they're studying. They're not in the field. Instead, they're putting sensors into the field that take photos or videos of animals or plants. 
um, or they put recorders in the field that record sounds of those organisms. And they also use genetic me methods that identify organisms using DNA that they shed into their environment. So all of these sensors create some distance between the researchers and what they're studying, and that has some interesting implications. I'll start by reading a little bit of my intro. In recent years, sensors have become less expensive, and the quality of sensors and the methods to analyze their data have improved. As a result, ecologists are using remote observation more and more in their research. The explosion is happening now, says Tal Levy, an ecologist at OSU who studies quantitative wildlife conservation, quantitative wildlife ecology, conservation, and environmental genetics at the Andrews. A review article published in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution found that the number of scientific publications with the keyword eDNA tripled from 2015 to 2018. The number with the keyword camera traps doubled, and the number with the keyword bioacoustics increased by 50%. There are good reasons for this shift. Remote sensing can help researchers learn about ecosystems. Because sensors don't always need someone physically present, researchers can use them to collect data at larger and finer scales and in places that are difficult to observe directly. Sensors can also detect a wider range of organisms than traditional methods. Levy says these technologies are like direct observation, but instead of just you, you've got 5,000 versions of you that can stay awake all night long. Simultaneously, researchers spend less time in the field when they use remote observation, and it is in the field where they often come up with research ideas and develop a deeper intuition for an ecosystem. Remote observation can also encourage the trend of finding patterns that animal that an animal lives in environments with specific characteristics, for example, without learning what causes those patterns, which of those characteristics are important to the animal and why. So I wanted to look at this shift through the lens of a specific place. And I chose the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, which is on the western side of the Cascades in Oregon. And it's one of 28 National Science Foundation funded long-term ecological research network sites. And that makes it a good place to study how the shift from more traditional methods to remote observation is changing because they have a history of doing both. And it's a 15,800 acre forest that is jointly managed by the Forest Services Pacific Northwest Research Station, Oregon State University, which is in Corvallis right there, and the Willamette National Forest. And it was established in 1948, so it's been around for a while. And in January, I got to travel to the to Oregon State University to interview a few a bunch of people and then to the Andrews itself to see the forest and also interview some people. It's pretty quiet in the winter. There aren't that many researchers there, but it was still like really impactful to be in the place and it helped reinforce part of the idea of my thesis, like how meaningful it is to not just talk to people and read things, but experience a place and like realize all the questions that I wouldn't have thought of if I had just been talking to people. So that was cool. And the main questions that my thesis was centered around is, are researchers able to get the benefits of remote observation while avoiding the risks? And are they able to find a balance between traditional methods and remote observation? And what does that look like in the place? So this is at the Andrews. By headquarters, they have this little loop through some old growth forests called the Discovery Trail. And towards this, the end of that, you start hearing the sound of a fan whirring, and you see all of this, all of these sensors. So right here on the Discovery Tree, they call it, this is a temperature sensor, and this is like a thin wire band with blue beads that measures as the tree contracts and expands each, each day and over the course of the season. Okay, so all of the photos, the photo in the first slide and in this one and to some to, in the ones to come are by David Paul Bales, who was an artist in resident at the Andrews. They have this program there called Long Term Ecological Reflections, where they bring artists in residence and writers in residence. So it's really cool to see their work and like see other people depict the place. And I think one project that's happening at the Andrews that exemplifies some of the benefits that remote observation can have, it uses camera traps. So these huge pieces of wood often fall into streams. And in the past, 
land managers have taken those out because they thought they made the stream unclean and blocked the passage of the fish. But researchers at the Andrews found that they're actually really important to the ecosystems, to the aquatic ecosystems specifically. There's still this big gap in scientific knowledge about how that would affect aquatic animals. So one researcher at Oregon State University, Von Arsmendi, wanted to, to see how, how that would impact terrestrial land animals. So he set up, in the past, the only option would be to like basically sit by, sit on the stream bank and, and look at the wood. But of course that takes a lot of time and animals behave differently when they're in the presence of humans. So now there are camera traps. He put, put them by the wood and just like took videos, 15 second videos whenever they sensed motion. And he found that land, an, land animals use this wood a lot. They use it to cross the stream, to rest, to find food and to eat. And I think this is a good example that shows how, how much the scale can increase when you use camera traps. Like rather than just one person sitting on the stream for a few hours a day, you can have camera traps all throughout the forest constantly recording what's going on. And here is a video of a few videos from the camera traps. <laughs> They're river authors. <laughs> At the same time, there's some risks to spending less time in the field to using this remote observation. And a lot of those involve in incomplete, having an incomplete understanding of the ecosystem. Like for example, with what we were just seeing, those camera traps are only capturing like one small frame. You don't know what's happening outside of that frame. Like is an animal crossing a log because it's being chased by a predator? Or is it just crossing because it wants to get to the other side? And I think like the next level out from remote observation, something that removes ecologists even more from what they're studying is data sharing, which has a lot of benefits. It's like a trend that has good reasons behind it because when researchers publish a study and share the data that they used in it, that means that more scientists can use that data and people can combine multiple data sets to look at broader trends. And one fifth of publications that use data that was collected, the Andrews aren't by people that collected the data themselves. But this can also go astray. In 2018, there was an article published in PNAS that found that invertebrate biomass at the Lucio LTR site in Puerto Rico fell from between 10 and 60 times from the 1970s to 2012 because of warming. But the people, because of global warming, the people that collected, that analyzed the data didn't realize that concentration was concentrated that collection was concentrated in specific parts of the site and it was taken soon after a hurricane. So when you take those two variables into account, the invertebrate biomass didn't actually fall because of warming. So having that incomplete understanding of, of data and like of an ecosystem can lead to inaccurate results. I love this photo of the Andrews, especially in the winter. It's just like so green and lush and alive. <laughs> For the most part, I found that people are balancing traditional methods and remote observation well at the Andrews. And there, although there are risks, those risks are on the mind of ecologists and they're finding ways to work around them. And even people that use remote observation still spend a good amount of time in the field. A good example of that is Nina Ferrari, who's a graduate student at Oregon State University, and she's using bioacoustics to study how birds are um, distributed in vertical space. And she set up acoustic recorders at 10 meter intervals up 14 trees in the Andrews, and that involved a lot of time in the fields, both to 
to set up the devices and to maintain them and to take them down. So this is a video of her doing that. Kind of sets up our permit. And so then from there, we can come back to the tree, rerun the rope through that pulley system, and essentially use a like fixed line, single rope system to ascend up the tree. So what you'll see here in this video is me using um, my chest roller and my knee ascender, my foot ascender, and a handle ascender to climb up this rope. Um, and then I'll be stopping at each station along the way to tend to the equipment. I gotta come out at least three times, one to install the equipment, once to take down the equipment, and once in between to swap batteries. I'll leave them out for the duration of the bird breeding season, so early May through mid-July. So even when researchers are using these remote observation methods, they still spend a lot of time in the field. I'm not sure how to get to the next slide. Why did you escape? And then um, play from current slide. Thank you. This is the section from the end of my thesis. For now, there's a sort of harmony at the Andrews. Half an hour from headquarters, along a winding gravel forest service road, Lookout Creek Old Growth Trail hugs the base of Lookout Mountain. A temperature sensor squats a few miles in, bright white in an expanse of green and brown. A black cord dangles from a tree, left from a graduate student who used it to pull a climbing rope up and study how dwarf mistletoe changed the structure of hemlock branches. Far from using remote sensing, he climbed the tree and measured the diameter, length, and direction of each branch, as well as where the dwarf mistletoe was on the branch. Some trees took four days to measure. There's still stuff like that that happens, says Schultz. All the while, the beauty of the Andrews holds steady. Lookout Creek roars downhill, leaving its cool breath behind. Further along the trail, the creek is out of sight, but still within earshot. Further still, it is snowing. Large wet flakes fleck the soft soil and emerald needles. Back down, the snow becomes a light rain and then a fog. It glows golden in the sinking sun. Okay. That's Thank you to thanks to my thesis advisor Kim Tingley who maintained a calm even when I didn't have that, and to Chris for giving me direction when it felt like there was no direction in sight, and most of all to the cohort for commiseration during the difficult times and excitement through it all. You're all great. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I think a question for you is you you have an ecology background and I know that you love nature a lot. Um, how do you feel about like technologies like this in the next 10 years and how they sort of going to change the field? Yeah. What what excites you? I mean about oh, what excites me about them? I think the like scale that that research can happen at is really exciting with these new technologies that it's not even like you can get larger scale um, like observe a bunch of different places more easily but you can get really fine and like and and to look at the trends across scales as well it's just more questions to, to answer. And you can still use traditional methods for, for questions that you can't answer using remote observation. So it's, I don't think it like limits things in that way. It just expands the notions that are there. Do you feel that that's going to like, I mean, draw, draw researchers? Like, because I think one thing that you always talk about is this experience that you always have when you are like, in these fields, um, but when you are not longer in those fields, like in person, 
Do you feel like those experiences are great so far? <laughs> yeah, I think so, <laughs> a little bit. I mean, a lot of the people I talk to still spend their free time outside, which is something like, I don't think it'll completely remove people from the environments that they're studying. It just like involves more in, intentional intentionality than it would if, if their research itself also involved time in the field. Yeah, um, you mentioned um, one of the benefits of doing this kind of remote sensing is that, um, you know, animals and wildlife behave differently when in the presence of humans. Um, I also know there's a, that, you know, you see those signs on hiking trails that are like, take only photos, leave only footprints, because like even like moving stones around can like have an effect on the ecosystem. I wonder, is there any sort of worry or risk that these remote sensing, like the, the, the like cameras and things that putting them in the forest can like also affect the ecosystem. Like if like mm. a, like a bird, like eats, tries to eat like one of those like bands around a tree or like if some of them might have like plastic and it would get like get into the environment, like, is that a risk? Yeah, I think it is a bit, but probably not that much more than, than traditional methods because those like also involved often putting things in the ecosystem. I think with radio collars, which is one form of remote sensing that like they use to track the movement of animals, mm -hmm. the animals that they put them on often like bite them off and, and that seems like more of a risk to me, but I don't know specifics. Alan? Um, what are some uh, observations that on-site humans can make that these uh, detectors cannot? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of observations that these detectors can make. I think it's the more holistic experience that they have trouble making. Like if you're using a camera trap, you're not hearing things, unless you're taking a video. If you're using a camera trap, you're not like getting a sense of the temperature and the sound and the whatever other sensations there are. It's just like more limited, so you don't you don't have the whole picture of what's going on. Oh, uh, I'm just kind of curious. What was the research about the heights of birds and trees? And what was you trying to figure out? <laughs> yeah, just generally how they're distributed. Cause I think, I think there hasn't been too much research on that in the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. old growth forests. There's someone that I talked to who was in a gondola on a construction crane and would like go to different heights and just observe <laughs> the birds there. But like, you obviously can't do that for that long or in that many, it was just in one forest. And so that, and then also like how climate Effects. Like everywhere that she has a recorder, she also has a temperature sensor. Cool. Tom? One thing I wonder is if the whole remote sensing uh, movement in ecology might do for sort of citizen science what um, a remote control of observatory, uh, easy for me to say, remote control of observatories has done for uh, citizen involvement in astronomy. Um, you know, because you know, if, you, if, if you've got camera traps that you can access remotely, if you've got data and so forth, you know, people who are disabled can do forest research. People who are, you know, in cities 3,000 miles away from the Andrews and so forth. Has, ha, is that part of this movement or is it still really confined to, to the, um, uh, you know, the research community? Yeah, that's a great point. I'm not sure what the specific links are between citizen science and remote observation. But your question did make me think back to data sharing and how like one one reason behind that is that it makes like people that don't have the privilege to go into the field can still use use that data without collecting it themselves. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.
great speaker notes. Those are good speaker notes. Right. And that will, that will liberate all of us. Are you, are you nervous? Like that. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you got your stress cue. We're going to take a quick, quick stretch break, and then we've got the last two. <laughs> 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 he said, am I muted? And I was like, hey, thanks. Uh, she can unmute herself, so. Yeah. Although, did you know that Akatsu is a word ceremony for her graduation? Akatsu's oh my god. Well, she unmuted, so she was on the giant speakers above, and she was like, oh, Akatsu! Like, oh my god. I have, I have totally am totally a team Colleen, so I, oh that sounds god, like an so awesome funny. thing. <laughs> no, we saw it, though. I was just confused because he didn't answer any of my messages earlier, so I was like, oh, he's probably not there. Oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> I, I said he's on in 30 minutes. Still is. I need oh, it's still 30 minutes now? Yeah, uh, Elizabeth's going to go and then he's last. Oh, okay. He's like dead last. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just didn't respond to those, so she might be the, yeah, just the tattoo on my leg. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see your first one of the spring recently. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, I saw those. Um, they're what are they called again? The uh, right now we swallow yeah. tails. Yeah, tiger swallow tails. It may have changed. Yeah, yeah. my temperature was in Philly. I don't think they were too high. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like, oh, I should have took this off because I, I started sweating. I went there, but then I was like, but I'm cold. I don't know, I know what I am. Party, I got to go to go to Falling Water and like be in this beautiful area while India was frantically setting up the wedding venue. I got to see like a bunch of beautiful swallowtail butterflies. So I was like. I'm having a great time. <laughs> he was like, oh, of him in front like of that thing, but he didn't want to do it. Oh, didn't? Yeah. I was going to do it when he goes up. Yeah. I'll do but it. But it'll be a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want people talking. I should have contacted them. Yeah, me too. If I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do his thesis, and then after he goes, I've had this. Oh, okay, okay. So then he won't have a choice whether we take a picture of him in front of it because it'll be. And first, um, I wanted to kind of start off. Uh, explaining what a soundscape is. So um, it's the audio equivalent of a landscape. And um, the parts that soundscapes consist of are three terms called biophony or biological sound like your bird song, insects, um, and mammals. And um, it also consists of geophony or the, or the sound of wind, rain, and thunder. And, um, and it's also consists of anthropony. So this, the noises that we make so about like cars, alarms, music, all those kinds of things. Um, and so the clip here is of Mount Rainier in Washington um, along the Summerland Trail. And um, I'll just have you listen to that in real quick. So here we hear um, anthropony as well as uh, biophony, so a chickadee and a um, the sound of a helicopter passing over. And so um, soundscapes matter because uh, changes caused by us through land, land use changes changes the way a soundscape sounds. And so listening to soundscapes can reveal the health of um, an ecosystem and the biodiversity found within. Um, and collecting and archiving the different sounds of soundscapes can reveal patterns of biodiversity across time and space and monitor human activities like logging and changes caused by uh, climate change. So up here, I have a few examples of how sound is collected. So a lot of researchers strap um, recorders or audio recorders onto trees, like the picture on the top. That is a, a recorder uh, strapped onto a tree in Gabon. And at the bottom here are some tripods um, located in, in Alaska. And um, they're also, the soundscapes are really important because they're a way to track our biodiversity loss. Um, and because once these species are lost, our natural soundscapes still change. And um, so um, on here, I have an example of the Kakapo. Uh, from New Zealand, and of course, my very favorite, the carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just a quick statistic: so, in 2019, the UN released a uh, report that found up to one million animal and plant species are on the verge of extinction. And so, um, for 
My thesis, I talked to various soundscape experts who are passionate about um, collecting the world's natural sound. And while I was writing uh, each passage of my thesis, I would listen to different soundscapes to kind of zone in the reader of where uh, researchers collected these uh, soundscapes. And so one of the first researchers that I talked to and reached out to um, was Brian. And he is one of the first researchers who uh, published a paper about soundscapes, um, kind of uh, detailing, who was the first person to detail the field in ecology uh, that had to do with sound. Um, and currently, he is working on a project with the Center of Focal Soundscapes called Vanishing Soundscapes. And um, his mission is to archive all the soundscapes in the 32 biomes on Earth. And so far, he has collected 1.2 million soundscapes. It was really hard to track down because he was constantly traveling to different parts of the world. And I finally got to talk to him. And he's like, I'm going to jump on a plane in a few hours to go to uh, Malaysia. So, <laughs> so very tough person to track down. Um, and so I also uh, had the opportunity to visit Susanna Borilova's lab in, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and their, um, and their lab called Sound Forest Lab. And she uses recorders to monitor uh, for the, the world's forest for conservation and diversity and protection. Um, so in 2016, before she uh, started her own lab at UW-Madison, uh, Susanna collected soundscape data from over 100 sites in the Borneo, Borneo uh, forest in Indonesia to see how the structures of soundscapes change as, uh, as a forest changes. So um, I'm going to play you a soundscape from a forest in Indonesia that hasn't been logged in 38 years. So it has time, it had time to regenerate and kind of bring the biodiversity back. So you can hear all the biodiversity. There's a lot of uh, birds singing. Um, and if, oh shit, I, I was worried about, we were able to see the spectrogram. But here, um, this gray box here is a picture of sound. And in it, you can see the different peaks of uh, each bird calling. And so to see how the structure changes as, as the use of a forest changes, um, Susanna also took uh, sound of an area in the forest that was transformed into an acacia plantation. And we can already tell by the spectrogram that it's going to sound very different. So I'll play that next. In this clip, less diversity is heard. It's very monotonous, and all we hear is the buzzing of insects. And um, our picture of sound is also absent of those uh, distinct, uh, diverse peaks that we saw before. And so because uh, Zuzana was able to see differences with the spectrograms and in the way that it sounds, uh, her current project now consists of traveling to uh, Central Africa, to Gabon, to do the same project that she did in, in uh, Indonesia here. <clears throat> and um, so my reporting also took me to uh, Wisconsin again, my home state, uh, where, and here is the uh, conservation biologist and nature writer, Aldo Leopold Schack, as it was in 1938. Um, and it is where he wrote his most famous uh, piece called the San County Almanac. Um, but in the 1940s, Aldo Leopold was also interested in soundscapes. And uh, he would rise before dawn with a pot of coffee pen and paper in hand and sit outside his shack and write down the species of birds that he heard or the time that he heard them and um, the what and the um, he had a monitor to monitor like daylight too and so um, in 2012 
uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Stan Templey at the University of Wisconsin-Madison found Alta Leopold's unpublished manuscript and used his notes to reconstruct what the Dawn Chorus sounded like at the shack in the 1940s. And so um, I was able to talk to uh, Stan Templey at, at a talk he gave at the <coughs> university, sorry, at the um, Museum of Wisconsin Art. And um, in the middle here is a picture of what all those notes look like. And it was really interesting to see how when he first took the notes, they were very, um, very simple. Like he'd write the time and the verse, <coughs> but over time he would add different uh, data, like uh, the amount of light available. And so using AI and uh, the Cornell Library Birdsong, uh, Stan was able to recreate what the Dawn chorus sounded like, and it is pretty long, so I'm only going to play a few seconds of it. And that is what it sounded like in the 1940s, but if you were to travel there today, it has changed completely. Um, not too far from the shack, they built a highway so we can hear um, human noise now too. And so um, for this thesis, I also interviewed researchers in Australia who are looking to use sound as a restorative tool um, and as a way to monitor ecosystems that have been destroyed by uh, wildfires and flooding. And so I'll start with a section of my thesis that kind of details that. So in the fall of 2022, Eastern Australia underwent extreme heavy rainfall that flooded areas in New South Wales and Victoria, and soundscape recordings had another chance to prove their worth. October was recorded as the wettest October on record in the Murray-Darling Basin, which includes Australia's longest system of rivers. Total rainfall numbers across the basin were near 150 millimeters, or about six inches, and it was four times the average for the month, breaking records set in 1950 and thousands of people were evacuated from the flash floods. And so here's a picture of how substantial the flooding was. So uh, the picture on the right is from September, and then uh, the one on the left is uh, from October. And you can see just the lines of blue, how, how uh, intense the flooding was. And so um, part of my research, I interviewed a researcher in Australia who was using soundscapes to uh, record wetland birds. And um, I'm going to read a section of my thesis that, that kind of explained that. So hidden in the reeds of wetlands skimming the forest edge, the endangered and cryptic bittern, heavy sought Aaron lays low, his streaky brown and buff plumage camouflaging its body. It stalks the reedy area, slowly lifting its feet and at times stopping to lift its neck high to blend in with the grass. Since 2021, Liz Snyder Sig has monitored the bittern. There are an estimated 1,300 Australasian bitterns nationally, with about 30% living within the forest. It is considered one of the most world's endangered water birds. And bitterns are like old avian Goldilocks. Their wetland habitats must be not too deep or too shallow and must be flooded for just the right amount of time. The proper water levels produce the plant communities needed for nest cover and food. And so when I was talking to Liz, she sent me a picture of um, her, her on a kayak to kind of show what it looks like to put uh, audio recorders in there. Um, and this was while the flooding happened. And then that's her standing uh, as the floodwaters receded in the same area that we saw before. And on the bottom here, we have the, the cryptic bittern with its neck high up. And so, um, Aside from collecting data on wetland birds, Liz is also collaborating with the um, Australian Acoustic Observatory 
um, and they call it the Australian Acoustics Observatory because it's like um, observing nature sound. So it's a play off of like the astronomical observatories that we have here. Um, and one of our projects consists of using the sound of healthy soundscapes to bring back ones that were destroyed by fire or by human impacts. And she's currently working on a pilot study to, um, to get that program off the ground. And so this is a picture of what the sound recorders look like um, across the continent of Australia. They are solar powered, which is really important. Um, otherwise you have to switch out the batteries a lot in these remote areas. And so part of Liz's uh, project pilot study here um, is using false color spectrograms. They're very different from the ones we saw earlier with the gray boxes. So the ones that I showed you earlier contain about 30 seconds of sound, but these contain um, sound over 24 hours. So you can see an entire day's worth of sound here. And they're called false color because each color represents a different species found in these areas. So they also, aside from showing diversity, they show, like you can tell how much diversity there is. Um, so the one at the top is an area that was burned by a wildfire in French Island. And then the one at the bottom is uh, an area that hasn't been burned, it's, it's thriving. So you can tell um, how these false color spectrograms can show differences in uh, restoration. And so I'll leave you with the last part of my thesis here. Um, so imagine a world where everyone stops and takes a moment to appreciate nature's orchestra. Every chirp, every swoop of wind, every squish of wet sand as hundreds of filler crabs burrow underneath and every crash of waves against the coast is noted and recorded by us. Each rhythm and note are recorded, categorized and preserved for future generations. Our soundscapes are ever present, but ever changing. Take a moment to listen. So um, or to my acknowledgments here, I wanna thank my thesis advisors, Mara O'Connor um, and Nikki for, for her edits. Um, Shannon for always having her door open to me, and Chris for, for all the help. Um, I would also like to thank the researchers that I interviewed and took time other day to uh, talk to me. And I also want to thank my uh, GPSW cohort for their constant support. <laughs> and uh, as well as I want to give thanks to my friends and family who are watching uh, online from home. <laughs> Yesterday. You can just leave it there. If that's there's like a weird pop up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. Uh. So, Allison's thesis talked about how they're creating these coral sort of banks with the thought of using them to preserve coral in the future. Um. Is there any thought of um, using some of this data to know how to appropriately restore species that have been removed from habitats? Or what are the different uses that are being considered for this type of data? Yeah, for, so um, I wish I could have talked more about, about the pilot study with Liz, but she's barely getting it off the ground. But her hope is to um, first collect the uh, sounds of healthy ecosystems to then use speakers to play it back in areas that have been burned by fire um, to attract animals into the area. So it's kind of like a beacon of hope. <laughs> I mean, so saying like, hey, we're cool over here, yeah. even if they're not actually there. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like calling, but, but she, she told me that she expects the animals not to stay because, you know, the area has been completely destroyed, but if they were to walk by, they would bring with them, you know, spores, fungi, bacteria, whatever's on their body, and it'll eventually restore the landscape. Yes? So a little question, how, how good does the recording equipment have to be? How, you know, are these sort of like, you know, audiophile quality microphones, or, or are they, you know, $10 ones from, from Radio Shack? Radio Shack still exists. <laughs> um, so the, the, Recorders that they use, they're, they're 
pretty good quality. They're about $300 per quarter, um, but they're built to withstand the elements. They're gonna be outside for a really long time. Um, and the reason that this, this uh, research has become recent uh, rather than the past is because the recorders have become cheaper to obtain and maintain. Yes. So that um, wonderful Dawn chorus um, was completely like using AI. Are you are, are these researchers like uh, hoping to in, in soundscapes that perhaps they weren't able to record before they were lost, uh, trying to recreate them with AI to do the same sort of restoration or is it is it really just like you really mean the actual recording of the, of the soundscape? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I've, I've never thought about that. It's a really good question. Um, but I know researchers were able to hear Aldo Leopold's Don Chorus because he took meticulous notes. So we still need at least something that tells us what it sounded like before. But with the Acoustic Observatory in Australia, what they're hoping is right now is to collect all kinds of sounds that we hear and then you know, maybe 50 years from now, a certain area no longer sounds that way. So we could go back and uh, listen to what it sounded like before to eventually restore it. Um, so Brian, the guy I showed earlier, he referred to these audio recordings as acoustic fossils. He's really cool. <laughs> 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 yes. When you talk about sounds and soundscapes, it's, it's pretty abstract, you know, and I wonder, like, how was it for you, like, writing about this topic and really trying to, you know, engage readers, uh, people who are going to read your know, story? Yeah. So um, when I was writing sections of the thesis, I, I think I mentioned this before, too, that I would um, pick a soundscape that I wanted to portray in the writing, and I would, like, play it, and I would write whatever I heard um, and try to show the reader um, or, or tell them like what it sounded like if they were to listen to. I think maybe if I added a media component to my thesis, it would have been more effective. Vish, we had a question. Oh yeah, did you have a favorite sound that you heard in all of your sound? <laughs> One of my favorite sounds that, that didn't make it into the thesis, but I did interview another researcher in Australia who's doing um, oyster reef restoration. And she found if she played the sound of snapping shrimp, it would attract oysters to the area and she she said it sounded like um, sizzling bacon on a pan and it really did if you play it it does sound like sizzling bacon and that's was probably my favorite sound that I discovered during my uh, reporting umbrella drink yet. <laughs> no pressure. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is William von Herf, um, and I'm going to be presenting my thesis uh, titled Under Their Own Laws, How the Kitsuhe's First Nation Created a New Marine Protected Area Without the Canadian Government's Approval. Now, I just want to start off by saying the Kitsuhe's First Nation is an Indigenous nation. I myself am not Indigenous, and if an Indigenous journalist were to approach this story, they would undeniably come away with a different perspective than I could ever bring. Now, everything I report here is accurate and um, true to the best of my knowledge, but it's important to understand, you know, the context that I bring to this being a settler. 
So I want to start off by introducing you, pardon me, to Kittisu Bay. This is a beautiful stretch of water located about halfway up the British Columbia coast along the Pacific coast of Canada. Kittisu Bay is home to one of the largest animal migrations in North America. Millions upon millions of herring come to this bay every April to spawn. The, the water clouds with eggs and sperm, and other animals are well aware of this phenomenon. A larger fish, ducks, seals, even whales come to feast on this. Indeed, the local indigenous population, the Kittisu Hayes Nation, are well, well aware of it as, uh, are well aware of it as well. They come to feed off the herring and their eggs, and many of the animals that gather to eat the herring and eggs. Um, <laughs> crucially, though, this area, while it was under Kittisu Hayes control, has been fished by them for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, settler Canadians have also started fishing the bay over the course of the last about 100 years. This has severely weakened the bay's ecosystem and has made it hard for the Kittisu Hayes to survive on occasion. The Kittisu Hayes First Nation um, lives, this is a rough outline of their territory. They're a very small First Nation. Current census numbers have them at about 535 people. And most of them live in this town right here, Clem Um That right there on the left, is, on the right, is Doug Naslas. He's been the elected chief of this nation since 2010, save for a brief two-year period in 2013 and 14. Um, he's here dual-wielding sea urchins, <laughs> and he is, um, he actually became chief first by being the Marine Planning Coordinator before becoming the stewardship officer and then chief. Um, he was gracious enough to meet with me in Montreal. He was going there for the UN Biodiversity Conference, and I spoke with him at length about um, Kittisu Bay and his nation's work. Uh, the other reason, or the main reason, rather, that he was in Montreal was to present a trailer for a film, a documentary that he has coming out. And I'm going to play you a snippet of that trailer right now. that poor editing work on my part there, but um, I want to focus in on this, this moment right here. We, the Kittisu Hayes Nation, hereby declare Kittisu Bay to be a marine protected area under our laws and inherent stewardship responsibilities. So what does this actually mean? The Kittisu Hayes First Nation um, are a nation, are an indigenous, indigenous nation within Canada. The, the challenge there is on one hand, Canada claims dominion over all of the lands that they claim, which includes British Columbia, and the Kittisu Hayes are within there. On the other hand, the Kittisu Hayes have never signed a treaty with the Canadian government. This is properly unceded and stolen land. The reason that they are declaring this um, protected area has to do with Indigenous stewardship. Indigenous stewardship is an umbrella term for um, conservation and management strategies that are done by Indigenous communities and governed by traditional laws, uh, wisdom, and practices. The Kittisu Hayes have a number of laws of these of their own. For instance, they know to never let blood touch the water during the herring spawn. So you know you don't hunt during the herring spawn. They know that, in fact, water, the uh, noise on the water dis uh, disturbs the herring. So going back pre-colonialism, they would even wrap their oars in towels. That's how little uh, noise they wanted on the bay. They know that runoff has a huge impact on herring spawn. And they know how much herring they can take while still maintaining a healthy population for next year. The truth is, indigenous stewardship, based on these sorts of laws that have been developed over thousands of years, is unambiguously extremely effective. There's countless examples over the world of this. Um, in southeastern Brazil, uh, rainforest that's protected by indigenous nation, indigenous people versus the Brazilian government, the indigenous uh, communities protect it better every time. Sahelian farmers um, in Africa, on the border between the Sahara Desert and the uh, rainforest, they their traditional um, uh, livestock rotation practices keep grassland from becoming forest. Indeed, there's even one study of the Karak Nation in Northern California found that land controlled by the Karak and governed using their practices was more biodiverse than wild land. The, it's, I mean, there is no doubt that if the Kitsu Hayes were able to have control over the management of their bay, they would manage it better than the Canadian government could. What the, the real goal here, though, because of all the legal challenges associated with whether or not the Kittisu Hayes have direct authority, have complete authority over their bay, is a co-management agreement. 
A co-management agreement is a system where an indigenous nation and a settler government agree to share power over a protected area evenly. The most prominent example of this is the Guayanas Haida Heritage Site and Marine Protected Area. This is a photo of it right here. Um, it's found in northern British Columbia. And when the agreement was signed in the 1990s, after years and years of protests over logging, they decided um, to set up a board that consisted of half Haida and half Canadian members. Any decision had to pass with a majority vote. So if there was ever a point of dis disagreement, they brought in outside counsel, they, uh, they brought in mediators, but there would never would be an agreement that did not at least have people from both sides involved with passing it. This is exactly the sort of thing that the Kittisuheis want. Um, there have been other nations that have reached similar agreements. Just this past February, the Mamalilakula First Nation in um, southern British Columbia reached an agreement over one of their protected areas. A little bit of nuance there, but broadly it's what the Kittisuheis are aiming for. So I'm going to take you through a timeline of the Kittisu Bay, leading from before colonialism to the present. As I said, the Kittisuheis have managed their bay for thousands of years, but they weren't known as the Kittisuheis at the time. It was two separate nations, the Kittisu and the Heihais. Indeed, they're entire separate uh, linguistic groups. But in the 1860s, a series of plagues ravaged their communities and they gathered in the area that's now known as Klemtu, and they formed a nation together. Um, in 1876, the Indian Act passed, which is a very, very upsetting piece of legislation that the Canadian government passed that created many of the problems that indigenous nations still face nowadays. Uh, um, the residential school system came out of the Indian Act, where indigenous children were taken from their communities and put into Christian schools where they were not allowed to practice their culture and were physically, mentally, and sexually abused. The um, potlatch system, which was a <coughs> system wherein coastal First Nations up and down the Pacific Coast would meet and gather and exchange wisdom, form alliances, um, form marriages, all of that was banned as well. <coughs> These sorts of passes right here were what were required for many nations in order to leave their reserve. The Indian Act created the, almost every, or a, a huge portion of the problems that indigenous nations face in Canada nowadays. Coming into the 1970s, doing a bit of a time jump here, the Kittisuais First Nation mostly relied on resource extraction in order to make ends meet. Um, logging and fishing were kind of the only way to operate. Unfortunately, Canadians were also logging and fishing in this territory. They didn't have to subsist on it, though. They were just selling it. In the 1970s, this came to, the head, came to a head in the Kittisu Hill protests. This enormous uh, two-cone cinder volcano that overlooks Kittisu Bay, um, a company was trying to log it, and the Kittisu Hayes managed to shut down the logging there because they knew that a runoff from logging would make it so that herring weren't able to spawn as well. We know nowadays, based off of uh, modern studies, that runoff is very detrimental for herring spawn. But the Kittisu Hayes have known this for a very long time, and I promise you that will become a theme of this presentation. In the 1990s, problem, conditions were still quite bad for the Kittisuheis. Um, resource extraction had only gotten worse. There was less fish and less logging to go around. Um, suicide was endemic. In 1992, 13 people in the community committed suicide. There were probably about 400 people total. This was when Doug, the, Doug Neslas, the modern chief, was growing up. It was a very dark time for the nation. In 1990, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada created a program called the Aboriginal Fisheries Strategy. This is how this man here, Ken Cripps, who is a white scientist, um, came to, first came to the nation. The idea behind Aboriginal Fisheries Strategies was a, new, a law had passed, or rather a Supreme Court decision had happened, that declared that Indigenous people had a right to fish in their waters that superseded the rights of settler Canadians. So, if the Canadian government wanted to open a fishery, they had to make sure there was enough food there for an indigenous, the indigenous population to have some as well. So, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans partnered with a variety of First Nations groups and in order to help manage their waters. The idea being, if you can manage your waters well, the indigenous nations have enough to eat, the Canadian government can open fisheries. And this was how Ken first arrived there. He was an invaluable source with this project as well. I've spoken with him extensively about some of the marine science involved here. And when Ken got involved with the nation for the first time, they were doing baseline surveys, the sort of fundamental management stuff that's needed um, in order to sort of translate traditional knowledge into science and into Western scientific uh, language. The challenge, though, was that this wasn't exactly a fair agreement between the DFO and the Kittisu Hayes. If the DFO ever felt that there was enough fish in the bay to open a fishery, the Kittisu Hayes didn't have much of a recourse, even if their traditional laws uh, meant that their, their traditional wisdom disagreed with it. 
the, if they ever could go to court, traditional knowledge didn't hold up in court nearly as well as science. So around this time in the late 90s and early 2000s, the case of Hayes embarked on something that Doug referred to as fighting science with science. They felt, well, if our traditional knowledge doesn't, isn't the language you speak, we're gonna try speaking your language. And I wanna say right off the bat, it is not just that an indigenous nation would have to can, would have to use Western science in this way. Their traditional knowledge has protected their resources for thousands upon thousands of years. It's not fair that only in, in this sudden recent turn of events they now have to convert that traditional knowledge into science. But one thing that they have conclusively proven is that the Kittisuhays are really, really good scientists. They started doing salmon surveys. They started surveying rockfish. They started um, doing measurements. These measurements on prawns is to determine the male-female sex ratio that would uh, uh, that so they can determine whether prawn ratios are healthy and promoting the best spawn. They started um, also incorporating traditional knowledge into science in a more meaningful way. They started looking at crab numbers and they compared this with what elders um, had observed. Elders, they talked to their community elders who explained about 7.5 crabs per trap is the expected amount, the amount that's in a healthy ecosystem. Um, they, and they took that knowledge as the same as if it had been found in a literature review. And, they then went to all the different inlets and bays in their territory, figured out which ones had less than 7.5 crabs per trap, and they closed them until they would regrow. So one of the most impressive examples of this work is with this, which is, this, which is a whole bucket of sea cucumbers. Um, sea cucumbers, you might know them as sort of scientific um, anomalies, but they're actually extremely valuable. Not only are they food, but they are important in traditional medicine in East Asia. So they cost upwards of $22 a pound. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans, of course, wanted to wanted and indeed did open a fishery for a sea cucumber. The problem was, though, they weren't very good at measuring how many sea cucumber were in a given area. Um, one of my uh, Ken Cripps, the source I talked to, described it as pulling numbers out of a hat. So they borrowed from the Kittisu Hayes. The Kittisu Hayes had designed a system for measuring sea cucumber density, where they put quadrats throughout a, uh, throughout the, um, a certain section of water. They measured how many sea cucumbers were in that area. They compared it to the depth at different points in the bay. They compared it with algal cover. And then they got a really solid estimate of how many sea cucumbers were in that body of water. The DFO used this method. Indeed, they still use this method to measure sea cucumbers. So as they developed their science some more, the Kittisuaes embarked on the beginnings of trying to create a marine protected area with the federal government in 2006. Um, the goal was to, as I said earlier, create um, a, 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 a marine protected area that was supported by indigenous, by the local indigenous population. Um, and this went okay at first. It was right around this time that Doug became marine planning coordinator. As the years went on, 2007, 2008, the agreements went on, or the, the conversations went on. 2010, um, Doug is elected chief and becomes the head of the newly formed stewardship authority, which was the uh, office that governed um, protecting the resources within the community. 2011, 2012, more waiting, more waiting, more meeting. In 2013, um, imagine something like Eversource that, or any other sort of local utility company. That's what Enbridge is. And Enbridge in 2013 wanted to run a pipeline through the Kittisu Hayes territory and through a number of First Nations territories. And the federal government was on board with it. Unfortunately, that would, not, that would mean that a marine protected area would not work in that area without causing environmental damage, so the government pulled out of the deal. The Kittisu Hayes spent much of the next while in court trying to fight this, um, this decision. It ended up, it, it, between the pressure from Kittisu Hayes and a number of other nations, it ended up working. Enbridge pulled out in 2016 and the pipeline was never built. But that sort of um, relationship defined much of the next period of time for the Kittisu Hayes. 2014 was an especially bad year. The DFO um, opened up a herring fishery um, without the Kittisu Hayes or any other local nation's approvals, and they sent a bunch of fishing boats to Kittisu Bay. They had to, the Kittisu Bay Hayes had to drive the fishing boats out in order to um, resecure control over their bay. That same year, um, the, the Kittisu Hayes took DFO to court over how many um, sea cucumbers they were allowing in fisheries. The thing was, something changed this time. The DFO actually decided to settle and the Kittisu Hayes got pretty much everything that they wanted out of the deal. According to one person I spoke to within the nation, 
That's because the Kitty Suhei science was just better. They just had more accurate data than anything that the DFO could provide with modeling. And this is something of a turning point where the Kitty Suhei science begins to supersede that of the DFO. 2015 rolls around, a new government's elected. The former conservative government um, was not reelected, and the liberals under Justin Trudeau took power. Um, this was when the Marine Planning, er, uh, the Marine Protected Area Network Action Plan began. Um, this, uh, and, and, and indeed, th they wanted the Kittisu Hayes involved. They wanted to turn Kittisu Bay into one of these marine protected areas. I spoke with Doug about this a little bit, and he explained that this was a very, very painful process. The DFO wanted more control than the Kittisu Hayes on a lot of different uh, on a lot of different points, and crucially. They wanted to do everything in the big picture, which unfortunately does not work when you're a small nation <coughs> that was only able to survive based on the food that's in your waters. So I'm now going to read a little section from my thesis um, about what happened next. The hope was to complete the MPA network planning process by February 2023 so they could announce it at IMPACT 5, a global conference on marine protected areas. Before then, though, on December 18th, 2021, there was to be a meeting between the Coastal First Nations and DFO. In DFO's letter preceding the meeting, however, there was no item on the agenda for the MPA network. The Coastal First Nations got a sudden sense of deja vu. The federal government was about to pull out again. So, according to Ken Cripps, the representatives from the Coastal First Nations, Don McCullough Council President Dallas Smith, Hiltzuk Chief Marilyn Slett, Haida President Gagwis, and Doug Naislas, among others, entered that meeting with a very clear strategy to rip them a new asshole. <laughs> in that Vancouver conference room, decades of frustration finally boiled over. The Coastal First Nations laid out what they needed to be done to rectify this situation, or else they threatened to cut DFO out of the planning process altogether. Whenever the two DFO representatives tried to argue, the group shot them down. It wasn't pretty, Cripps said. When they were done, they walked out of the room with the threat of, we could be on the world stage at Impact 5 announcing great things, or we'll just drag you through the mud so badly you won't even know what hit you. The Kittisu Hayes were done waiting. December 18 broke the camel's back, Cripps said. By that point, there was nothing left to do. Nayslaus went back to Clemtu and told his community that they wanted to go ahead without the federal government and create their own MPA. The community was near unanimous in their support. Finally, the Kittisu Hayes had the chance to be the principal authority deciding how to manage their bay. In the background of these political machinations, the Kittisu Hayes Stewardship Authority and other offices had been assembling management plans and doing groundbreaking science to guide their decision making. It was time to put it all to work. But first, on June 21st, 2022, the community of Clem 2 gathered in the big house, the enormous cedarwood longhouse that the Kittisu Hayes used for important ceremonies. Nearly every Clem 2 resident was present. The hereditary chiefs and the matriarchs, dressed in traditional style and flanked by the enormous totem poles, spoke before the community about the decision to create the new MPA. The official declaration was drawn up and signed by Nayslaus and two hereditary chiefs. Soon, the singing and drumming began, with community members dancing in the sandy ground at the center of the big house. There was a lot of work ahead, but just for a moment, the community could celebrate. So what happens now? The Kittis Suhais have to clear this marine protected area. Now what are they going to do? Well, first of all, they're going to continue doing the research they've been doing and expanding it extensively. The Kittis Suhais, thanks to um, a number of partnerships with local universities, especially the University of uh, Victoria, have managed to expand their scientific capacity extensively. Um, they've done research with eDNA to figure out the genetic makeup of their spirit bear population. They've been using a drone power, um, um, AI powered drones to count ducks in their bay. They've been using satellite technology to assess the spread of, uh, of kelp. They've been uh, examining the impact of European green crab on uh, eelgrass beds. But of course, a protected area is only prote is protected by people. So they used a sort of dual prong approach to protecting their area. First of all, they had their coastal guardian watchmen. This was a this is sort of their equivalent of park rangers. In fact, a, a few weeks before the protected area was declared, the British Columbia government gave the coastal um, guardians the same authority as provincial park rangers. Um, they are there to um, make sure visitors are staying in the correct parts of the uh, the correct parts of their waters. They prevent poaching and they do everything to um, make sure that their resources are protected. At the same time, though, the Kittisu Hayes struck a number of deals with, with fishery lobbies. They would speak to people who were, speak to lobbies that were dedicated just to clams, just to salmon, just to herring, and, and, and struck deals with them. They would say, okay, you're allowed to fish in this part of 
the of our waters, but not in this part. And they would say, you're allowed to fish in this part, but you uh, have to give us a cut of the profits or a certain amount of money. This is how they fund a lot of their conservation work. Um, when I was in Montreal and Doug gave his speech, he mentioned that only a few hours earlier, they had signed a deal with the last lobby that they needed to sign in order to keep every fishery lobby out of Kitasu Bay. At this point, they've all but cut the federal government out of protecting this area. They've managed to deal with industries, they've managed to deal with poachers. They're both the carrot and the stick of the government that they, that they need to be to relate to outsiders. And that's where I thought this presentation was going to end. But then, on February 5th, 2023, remember that conference that I mentioned earlier, Impact 5? Well, it was held. And the Department of Fisheries and Oceans decided to come back to the table and go ahead with the Marine uh, Protected Area Network. Um, a, whole, a, a number of First Nations uh, leaders spoke there, including Dallas Smith and Marilyn Slett, who were at that meeting in Vancouver. And they, the DFO and these nations all agreed to go forward with the MPA network. Dallas Smith has this great quote where he, said, uh, where, where he opens his speech by saying, miraculous might be too strong a word. We've worked too hard for this to be a miracle. And according to this plan, by 2025, there should be a, a federal Canadian marine protected area overlapping with the Kittisu Hayes protected area in the Bay. Of course, this is the federal government. They've pulled out twice before. It, and a new election changes in the political climate can change whether these things actually happen. So it remains to be seen whether they will follow through. But it's in the best interest of the government to do so. Indigenous um, communities are declaring protected areas more and more every year. And it's up to the government whether they want to fall behind or whether they want to keep up. Indigenous protected areas are the way of the future. And if the government wants to stay in the past, that's up to them. Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank a few people here. Of course, Alan, my incredible thesis advisor, who managed to turn just a collection of ideas into something resembling a story. <laughs> um, Chris. You, who was my freelance um, advisor for so much of the semester and an endless source of moral support you, slash therapist half the time. <laughs> Everyone at GPSW, Shannon, Tom, Seth, all of you have been so, so supportive. All of my cohort mates, so grateful to all of you for supporting me and for uh, helping to workshop my thesis. And of course, my wonderful girlfriend, Cassie, here being pushed very fast on a sled, <laughs> <laughs> has dealt with so much this past year and has been so supportive of me endlessly, has never, never made me question whether or not doing this was the right decision. And this work is as much a product of your support as it is my actual work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh wait, those questions. Oh my god. Alan. <laughs> 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 Before this miraculous meeting in February, in which the Canadian government agreed to play ball with the MPA and the, uh, the indigenous people were just making individual agreements with lobbyists one at a time, mm -hmm. how would those agreements have been enforced? So, yeah, so that's where the, um, so there's, there's two ways. First of all, and again, referencing sort of the carrot stick approach, the carrot approach is Let's say there's a clam fisherman that wants to go rogue and start fishing in Kittisu Bay where he's not allowed. If the, um, the guardian, if, if the watchmen catch them, first of all, they could charge them 100%. Um, and they also are threatening the relationship between the Kittisu Hayes and the fishery lobby. So they get in trouble both with the Kittisu Hayes and the fishery lobby. They could risk serious reper repercussions from both sides. Um, and then, of course, there's just the direct action of if there's random poachers that want to steal uh, crabs or something like that, the Guardian Watchmen just shut them down and kick them out and oftentimes also take their crabs. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, first off, hats off to you for this incredible reporting and story. Um, last fall, your visual and I took a class on Indigenous history at MIT and we learned a lot about Indigenous methodologies, and, and research and sort of relationality, which you acknowledge your position in, in this story. But can you tell us a bit more about like how you've been able to draw from some of the lessons 
and, and that I, I think yeah. not many journalists, you know, will, will have that. Yeah, I think that was that's definitely an important thing. It's sort of why I did the little positionality statement at the beginning, because um, if a Kirisuhei journalist decided to take a look at this story, they would, of course, come away with a radically different perspective. Um, I think that the importance of sort of in journalism of acknowledging your own biases that don't that are not even personal but they're cultural they're based on how you grew up all those sorts of things are especially crucial when dealing with indigenous communities because their um like philosophy government systems and way of living is often very different from the way that western society sort of prioritizes itself and designs its systems and while i like i said everything i reported here is accurate as far as i've been able to discern the challenge is that there are going to be elements that I will never be able to properly express. I'm, I don't have their say, the Kittisu Hayes's relationship to their land. I don't have their relationship to their resources. So I can only, I can, I can empathize, but I, we can never truly share what that's like. You know what I mean? V? I was wondering if you could speak a bit about, um, like, the difference between indigenous and Western science, because you, you've mentioned that indigenous mm -hmm. science isn't just science done by indigenous people. It's it's a sort of a specific perspective on science. Yeah, it's so that's a it's it's a very complicated question, and, and there, it's a great question, but a very complicated answer. And there's there've been books written on this subject. <laughs> um, this the sort of when I say indigenous science, um, the first the most important thing is uh, the way that indigenous science upholds traditional knowledge. So when I mentioned that thing about sort of doing a literature review of traditional knowledge, every time that the stewardship authority starts a new study, they first talk to a bunch of community elders over a cup of tea and say, so what do you like, like what, what's your experience about, you know, the crab population, the abalone population, the sea, like, have you noticed any changes in eelgrass? And they talk to a number of elders, and if there's consistency, they view that as a as akin to finding a strong finding within a literature review. Of course, it can be challenged, but the that is that is prior research. That's the first big part. And the second big part is sort of the holistic relationship with um, their landscape. That's more increasingly a thing in ecology nowadays. Ecosystem um, level ecology is huge, but it's impossible. Indigenous methodology generally, I can't, you know, can't speak, can't speak, I, can only, I can't speak too broadly here, holds that a salmon isn't just a salmon, it's a salmon that's relating to so many other things. And you can't cut that part out of uh, the rest of the science, if that makes sense. Tom? Um, I'm, this may be off the, the track of, of, of your research, but I was struck by the sort of strange moment when you mentioned um, that, the, uh, the, the, that there were two linguistic groups and then mm -hmm. this catastrophe brought them together. And it made me wonder is how much of the, of the local languages are still present in the area? And did you get any sense that um, discussions of the ecosystem, the land, the territory in those languages um, was significant to the way people were developing things like management plans and so forth and so on? My understanding is that the languages are not spoken extensively. Um, I believe that I'll have to fact check because I can't say this 100% confidence. One of the two languages, I understand there's only one living native speaker. Um, and I can't say for sure, but when I, again, I can't say that with 100% confidence. I would need to fact check that. Um, but no, the residential school system and the ban, potlatch ban and the reservation system, all of that really made it hard for indigenous communities to continue their languages and cultures. It was, it's extremely difficult. The, one of the miraculous things about the Kittisu Hayes is that they've managed to recover a lot of that culture. They didn't build their big house until 2002. And they have got part of the, another one of the duties of the stewardship authority is actually to preserve their language as a resource and to catalog the, the sort of the last remaining speakers, understand how the language works and preserve it for younger generations. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you. No one commented that it wasn't. We want to make some concluding remarks. All right. Wait. I know. That's the most shocking part, honestly. Yeah. You're also she's surprised right. nobody commented, like, why is it not about birds? <laughs> Alan, thank you so much for everything. Well done. Uh, well done.
I tried real hard not to sneak in a thesis joke. Thank you, everyone, for a fantastic thesis presentation. Thank you for everybody who joined us over live stream um, for these events. Again, thank you to the thesis advisors and to Michael and Shannon for running today. And thank you for thank you to the Kelly Douglas Fund for funding all the, the travel that has gone into this. We're going to take uh, just a couple minute break to sort of switch it up for the documentary films, but we'll be back in five minutes or so. All right. Great. Her mom said it was so great and that she understood it. That makes me so happy. <laughs> she understood.